when my dad hit me, I would freeze. And he just got on top of me and he just started kissing the side of my face. In the documentary, I underplayed it by a hundred times. Excluded, eventually got expelled, got an ASBO. I would normally stand by every person's head that I knocked out. They put me in a padded room because I was just, just hysterical. Doesn't mean to say they didn't have the ability to be a good person, but I was a piece of shit. 24 years old in prison again. She thought I was going to learn how to do pi, the calculation. But what I'd done is I'd memorized pi to 100 decimal places. 3.141592653589732384626433832795022. And I tried my hardest. I would read all the books. I would go to the library. I would cycle there in the rain, in the snow. Such a cliche fucking story, but it's true. But it was like the opposite happened. It's like things started to spiral into control. When you slit your throat, was you thinking, I'm going to kill myself in front of you? Just a quick one. I want to thank our main sponsors, Bow Security. They're a UK-based security firm that cover the entertainment, industrial, corporate and construction industries. I'm going to leave the links to their Instagram and their website below in the description so you can contact them direct. You can also find my own social media platforms down there too. And if you've got this far and you haven't yet liked and subscribed to the channel, can I ask that you do so? It takes two seconds, costs nothing, and it helps us improve the experience for the guests and for those at home watching. Thanks again. Your support is greatly appreciated and I hope you enjoy this one. Lewis, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. I obviously first saw you on the Netflix documentary, The Psychopath Life Coach. I love a happy ending because obviously it wasn't always happy, your story. And I had a little flirt about the internet. Mm -hmm. Let me see what else I can find other, other, other than that. Looks at your social media profile, very impressive. Looks at your business. Wow. <laughs> so the million dollar question. Go for it. Are you a psychopath? If I was to give you a yes or a no answer, which is what I haven't really done up until now, I would probably say yes. But then obviously I need to give context to it. So there's a lot of context to this. So there's there's the age-old debate of nature versus nurture. But keep it specific to you as an yeah. individual. Uh, well, the honest answer is I don't really know because I only know how I function and I, and I can sort of compare myself to other people. And I know that's different, but I don't know whether that's psychopathy, whether that's because I've been brought up differently, whether that's because I'm just a little bit different, whether that's because I'm autistic, which a lot of people have been DMing me about, like diagnosing me with all sorts of other stuff. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, byproduct of lots of trauma and emotional shutdown. There's so many things it could be. And I'm not, a, you know, a psychiatrist and I can't diagnose myself. But I, I have been diagnosed on more than one occasion with being a psychopath. So in the eyes of labelling and psychiatry, yeah, I am one. Um, am I a full-blown psychopath that people would perceive in their mind as a psychopath? Absolutely not. Because people don't know what a psychopath is. People only know what psychopaths are in the realm of serial killer documentaries and films. And they think of the person that wants to deliberately harm people and hurt people. Psychopaths can hurt people because they have the ability to. It doesn't necessarily mean they will um, because they are. They have less fear. Uh, they take more risks. Um, they just don't have that emotional response. They don't have the remorse or the guilt. And I'll be honest, those things are very, very low on my um, scale. You know, I don't really feel those things. Um, they're there, but it has to be extreme. And they're there for not long, you know. So... I see it as a spectrum. You've got empaths who are very, very emotionally tuned and they absorb other people's energy. So if other people are upset or if even they see someone getting upset, they don't even know what it's about. They'll feel it and they'll cry. You know, they are people like that. And I've coached people like that and they've watched a film and they can't get it out of their head for two days and shit like that. And I, just, I can't, my brain can't grasp that at all. But then you've got people in the middle that have a balanced range of emotion that fill this lovely spectrum, rainbow colours of emotion from anger to happiness to joy to fulfilment and to fully process and understand what's going on in, in the human experience. And then you've got people right down the other end that literally are, would kill you and go to sleep that night, you know, or even maybe get a thrill out of it. But I know I'm definitely on that spectrum. I'm not on the end where I don't feel anything. I don't want to hurt people, um, but I could. And also... Um, my emotional spectrum is quite low to the point where I do look at other people and just think, fucking hell, like, that's a different, that's different. That's not me. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, so there, there's no 
there's no songs that you've ever listened to or there's no films, no scenes that have pulled on your heartstrings and, I mean, I've certainly cried in the cinema. There, there's been once. <laughs> so, have you seen that, The Star Is Born um, with uh, Lady Gaga? And Bradley Cooper. Yeah, and he hangs himself in the, at the end. Mm. That one, I kind of, I just felt it. But, but didn't cry? No, no. I've never, I've never, no, never, never done that. But I just felt it, just about. I was like, oh, yeah. But, yeah, that's the only time. Did you cry when you was a kid? Yeah, but out of anger. Like, hysterical, you know, when you, well, mm. I don't know, if I was like this anyway, just like crazy. Um, I spoke about the documentary, I used to look at myself in the mirror and just like hysterically cry. I'm like trying to like force veins to pop out my own head and punch myself in the head because I was just angry at myself, you know. So my crime was hysterical rage. I can relate to the to the frustration, the inner anger, the standing there and shaking and that sort of stuff. I mean, I used to I used to do exactly the same thing. And it sounds to me like for a very similar reason that you were doing yeah. as well, the uh, the abusive father. Mine was absent, yours was present. So mm -hmm. although the behaviour of mine was probably more severe than yours, yours was more consistent and regular. Therefore, I'd imagine certainly equally, possibly more damaging because there's no breathing space. How was your dad abusive towards you? What did he do? He would be mainly verbally abusive. Um, and you know what? Like in comparison to yours, it really doesn't feel that much, but it did affect me. But he would call me a buffoon. He'd tell me I never amount to anything. He'd call me stupid a lot. He'd just look at me with disgust. It's probably the worst thing. He'd just look at me like, like I was a scumbag. Um, you compare me to my brother, he'd say things like, oh, why can't you be funny like your brother? Or, oh, you know, we, everyone knows your brother's the intelligent one, you know, just digs like that, you know. Was he more passive aggressive? Well, that's, yeah, that was just him on a day to day. But we'd also, we just can't, we couldn't have a conversation about it turning into an argument. And he would be, he, he had anger issues. So that's where I learned that from. He, he would just burst at the, you know, his, his, his face would go bright red veins down his face and he'd just be like shouting and screaming at me. And that's, I must have learned that. Um, because that was the only emotion that was ever expressed in my house. I've never seen my mum and dad cry. I've never shown, never seen them show any kind of empathy or or anything. Say sorry, or ask me how I am, or let's have a chat about what's going on. Nothing like that ever happened once. The only thing that happened is this: if I was naughty, or if we had a falling out over a conversation somehow, it was just utter rage. A lot of people wouldn't consider their dad calling them a buffoon, particularly abusive. Mm -hmm. However. I know the power of something that's said on repeat. And if every single day you've got your dad telling you you're a buffoon, you're a buffoon, what is sort of a sort of a, a mild, not particularly offensive word? You put a tone on it, you put a stare and on it. And it was a tone on it as you, well. Yeah, you put it on repeat. All of a sudden, it, it, it isn't really the word buffoon anymore. It's something far more sinister than that. Well, I didn't even know what it meant. I thought until I was actually an adult, and where I thought, hang on a minute, what the fuck does that even mean? I thought it was going to be a baboon the whole time uh. <laughs> in my brain. <laughs> and then I found, I was like, what's a buffoon? And I think it's like a jester, kind of like some kind of idiot. So I didn't even know what it's called me, but it's just the way he said it. You know, he was like, you are a buffoon, you know. But also he would hit me as well. You know, it's not like he just did those things. But the, the, the worst thing about it, though, was there was no nice as well. You know, if you have a balance and this loving dad is supportive and every now and again blows his lid, hmm. okay, that's pretty normal. But, like, my dad was an alcoholic. He'd come back from work. He'd lock himself in his study, which is his computer, and he would just sit there and just drink to his blackout drunk. And then every now and again we would, you know, have an argument. But, you know, it's not like it was, I guess, 900% of the time or for me. You know, we'd have a Christmas, you know. We would go away on, like, a holiday to Wales, never went abroad or anything, but go on like a holiday to Wales and there was attempts of a, of a family there, you know. On the surface, it might have looked okay, mm. but they're just the, the emotional nurturing was com was not there and the kind of abuse on a less sort of obvious level was affecting me and I didn't know it. And how far and frequent did your dad take the physical abuse? Not often, not often, I'll be honest. Like, it was probably a handful of times. And he never wanted it to, like, really... You could tell he didn't want to hit, hit me. Like, he would be hitting me and pulling his arm back, you know, like, p pulling it back before pulling he Pulling really, his punches. Yeah, mm. so he doesn't connect properly. Uh, but he, he wanted to hurt me, you know, and that's just as bad, you know, knowing that they want to hurt you. Yeah, yeah. well, for me, uh, 
I've lost count how many how many fights I've had, and not one of them really have had a lasting effect. That they haven't hurt me, but there's still words that were said to me years back that will stick. I mean, mm. yeah, words, psychological abuse, in short, yeah. in my opinion, is is far worse than physical abuse, unless you're being tortured, for example. Yeah, but yeah, words. You take words to the grave with you. Yeah, and another thing they did, uh, he did well, it was a, it's a they thing because my dad kind of manipulated my mum into wanting to do it. I should imagine she didn't want to. Because my mum loved me in her way, but she never showed it. She her she came from like a, you know, my granddad was in the military, very strict household, don't speak unless you're spoken to. So she never told me she loved me or gave me hugs or anything like that because she didn't have that. So I didn't get any of that. No hugs, no love yous. Um, I can't remember what I was going with that. Yeah, but she, but you could, but I can look at it logically and know she loved me, but she didn't really know how to show that. And she was kind of always on my side, but was, I think, scared of my dad. So if my dad said something, she'd go along with it. So anyway, my dad, for sure, made a decision to ring fence me from the family. And that was the word. Fucking, he always uses these fucking weird words. I don't know why. It's maybe even more psychological fucking torment because I don't know what the fuck he's talking about. But ring fence, which meant we are cutting you off. And that doesn't mean like I'm some fucking posh boy that's been given a credit card because he can give me not a fucking pound in his life. But um, they just said, he just said, you're not allowed to be a part of the family anymore. Did so you can live here until you're old enough to leave or you can get, you know, you've got to get your own place, but like you're not going to get dinner anymore, um, you know, because you're affecting your family and you're affecting me and your mum's relationship because of your behaviour. Because at this point, obviously, because of everything's going on, I'm being a little shit. So we can obviously go into that. Um, and was it always unpleasant with your dad in, in your I'd never, I've never, I can never remember. A good, I cannot remember a good memory. That's fucking terrible. There must have been some there. Maybe I've forgotten. I'm sure. I'm sure there's a few. I mean, yeah, there are a few. I think. I think I don't acknowledge the few. Um, but there were probably a few. Yeah. When someone's that bad to you. The few good things they do, they pale into insignificance, don't they? The biggest thing for me was just he made me feel unlovable and bad. That was the it, and, I, and no one can make you feel anything, and you learn that later on in your mindset and you know, mm. all that. But at a, at a, you know, when you're a child, you know, you don't understand those things. And um, you know, I remember looking up at him, hitting me, thinking because I got a bit older at one point, of course, <laughs> yeah, do grow. And um, I remember once, and I must have been at this point. 17 maybe but who knows roughly that age and I'd got a growth spurt become like six foot and um, I was thinking mm, I could probably beat you up now mm. because you're you know fat unhealthy man quite big lad you know, he's six foot big but still you know I don't he probably hadn't thrown a punch in 20 years um, but I thought I can't oh, I can't couldn't hit you because uh, I love you which is an interesting thing with the psychopath thing. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I knew I loved him and I knew I couldn't hit him because of that. Um, and by the way, remember, I'm not on the full end of the, the psychopath spectrum where I can't love, you know. It, it's definitely different for me. And I can talk about that if you like in, in terms of how I see love. C being the key way, uh, the key word there. But um, but I couldn't hit him because I loved him. And But then I knew he was hitting me and that kind of made me think that he must not love me. And when you've got people around you that are the closest people to you that you think treat you that way and don't love you, the only assumption I must have subconsciously you know, drew was I'm bad, I'm, I'm, I'm lovable, and if this, these people treat me like this, then I'm in real trouble, you know? Um, it creates big trust issues. If the person that you're supposed to trust the most in the world mm -hmm. can treat you that appallingly, you then think, well, when you're out in the, in the big wide world in amongst all sorts... You think, well, how can I trust anyone? Mm. And that's a problem. Yeah. Heavy, heavy shit. So got back to your childhood then. So very unpleasant. Your dad's abusive. Uh, predominantly it was psychological abuse, but there was physical abuse intermittently. And then you you got into singing, dancing, drama. Yeah. Was that to escape, do you think? I think when you're a child, you're subconsciously driven rather than logically aware of what you're doing. And uh, I now know that I just didn't feel loved when I was younger. And I wanted to feel loved. But I didn't really understand love because I'd never had it. Or maybe I had it but didn't know how to receive it. You know, maybe my mum and dad were radiating <clears throat> love to me in the normal human way that people do. And I just didn't get it. I don't know. I really don't know. But I didn't know or understand love. But what I did kind of understand, at, even at a young age, was significance, which is as close to love as I could probably match 
Um, Because when you feel loved, you kind of feel significant and like good about yourself, right? But but also the significance can also come from a sort of grandiose, I'm big, I'm special kind of place. And unfortunately, mine was the sort of latter, you know. So it's strange for a young boy at the age of like seven years old to be like, I want to be famous. That's that was my that was my goal. I did acting, singing, and dancing, not because I liked acting, singing, and dancing. Didn't mind it. I liked them all, but I didn't really have a passion for it. Didn't care which one it was. But I liked being on stage. I liked people looking at me. The adulation. Yeah, I liked being significant, and I got a bit of it from that. Um, and I would take it to the extreme, like I was extreme from a child. So I did. Um, I didn't just want to go and do dancing. So I said there was hip hop da- dance lessons, and that was that's pretty cool. But no, I want to do ballet and tap dancing. Because I want you to know that I'm different, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I want to be, and, and I want to be seen for this, you know, and I want to be like, oh my god, yeah, this boy doing, you know, and this was, you know, it's probably quite normal now, but you know, back then, boy doing ballet is not it. I mean, this was literally when must have been when Billy Elliot came out. But there's not, there's not, there's not many people out there I wouldn't have thought that would go from ballet to Borstal. <laughs> yeah, that's good. But yeah, I, I was actually in the, in the newspaper for that as well. For me, and there's a picture of me, and you see it in the documentary. You know, of me like in, you know tap dancing shoes and this little little kid. And did you enjoy it? Yeah, I did. Yeah, but I don't know if I enjoyed the the art and the craft of it, or if I enjoyed the, the intention and the extremeness of my behaviour and kind of the intensity of it. Because I was like acting, singing, dancing every day of the week. And fair play to my mum and dad; they practically did provide for me. So I always had my school uniform. You know, if I wanted to do like classes and stuff, they would do that. So they. So the thing, that's the weird thing. It's like on the surface, logically, they did show elements of love there, but it was such a practical, surf, surf, superficial way. You know, the real core love attention that I needed wasn't there. But yeah, they they would pay for me to do the lessons I wanted, which, you know, does say a lot. I mean, there's a lot of people that wouldn't have got that. But I would do, do different ones. So I'd, do, I'd sing in the choir. I would go dance lessons, acting lessons. But on the weekend, I would do st- yeah, stage school. And how long was you doing all that for? Probably around three or four years, between the age of seven and eleven, because it was it was it stopped the moment I got to secondary school. And this is where the story takes its first sinister turn. Mm. And uh, and just so you know, you're you're set opposite someone that has yeah been in similar situations, and so I get it. Although you're a psychopath and don't care if I'm with you or I'm not, <laughs> yeah, don't give a shit. <laughs> No, I appreciate it. Um, no, because I understand that stuff rationally, you know, so it means just as much. So thank you. Um, but I can relive these memories and um, it doesn't affect me emotionally any, in any way. So I don't know whether or not um, I'm really shut off from it completely if I've done a lot of work on myself through therapy or that just emotional capacity just doesn't really... Here, but anyway, I can talk about it as much detail. Yeah, so, you could ask anything. Okay, let's uh, let's treat it as what it is. Yeah, black and white. You were sexually abused at eleven. How did that take place? So it was actually someone at the stage school. It wasn't someone that worked there. It was someone that was actually in the class. I don't know how old they were. I thought at the time they must have been just a bit older. I think I thought he must have been maybe fifteen because he was smoking weed. So he was like, and I was like ten or eleven. Round about that time, because it was when I was going to secondary school. I couldn't remember exactly how old I was, but it was just before I went into secondary school. So um, so he was older, obviously older, but probably just about within that age bracket where it was just about acceptable. But on reflection, looking back, thinking about it, I'm like, mm, he was probably actually older than that. So he's probably 18, maybe. So here's a question then. So from a, a physical point of view, yeah, was he developed yeah, he was. Just, yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, and I was a little boy. Yeah, I was. If you saw the picture in the documentary, I was a boy, a little kid. You were a child. You hadn't started. And he was a teenager. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, he had a hairy cock. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. he's so he's blatantly abusing you. That's yeah. not that's not a mutual thing. Yeah, and I didn't I didn't even know. I so I thought we were mates, and he invited me around to sleep over at his house, and it, it was I think it I guess. My mum and dad or something must have said, all right, you know, because I think at that age I used to ask. Mm. Uh, I can't remember that because I buried this for a long time, by the way, as well. Um, and I also didn't really see it as a big deal as well. That's another thing. I don't know if that was denial or because I didn't have anyone to talk about it or I thought, fucking hell, maybe this happens every now and again. You know, I don't know. But So I don't remember the specifics. But 
what happened was I went round to his house knowingly. His mum was, you know, living in the house and we'd have a, we had a sleepover. That's odd that his mum would allow him to invite a young boy round to stay. Well, or maybe she just thought it was his mate. Mm. I mean, I remember when we had a, like a little group of mates and there were various ages. I wouldn't, I don't, yeah, I don't think you'd let him stay over. No. Nah. Anyway, it was, a, it was an innocent night. I was watching TV uh, with him. He had a bunk bed, um, two two beds. Don't know why I had two beds. Um, but I was on the top bunk and I just dangled my arm down because I was just chilling out. And then he grabbed my hand and I didn't know what to do. You know, obviously you think your first reaction is to go, what the fuck are you doing? But obviously when you're 10, I hadn't quite become that lad yet, you know. Mm. So, you know, I was a ballerina. <laughs> 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 Although, by the way, I was still a little shit, mm. by, by the way, actually. I wasn't, like, a good boy. Mate, I that's was... probably why he made a move on you. True. He probably, yeah, that's a good point. Actually. He's probably quite a sexy ballerina at that age. <laughs> <laughs> the sexiest boy did ballerina. Hair, did you have the hair and the teeth back then? Well, I had, I had like, the slick back with the spikes. That was the fashion at the time, but, but not the teeth, no. But, um, so, yeah, he grabbed my hand, and I kind of just... What the fuck's going on? He's holding my hand, and then too too long had passed now to take it away. So it, I kind of like stuck with holding this guy's hand because I just didn't know how to change <laughs> that scenario. So I'm like, well, I'm holding his hand, mm. just trying to process what the fuck's happening. Things are clicking. Like, oh god, maybe you know, what is he? Yeah, is this guy gay? You know, is it? and then he starts coming up on the top bunk, and. Uh, and it's so cliche, but you, you must have heard of fight, flight, or freeze, right? Mm -hmm. And I've done this before. Um, when my dad hit me, I would freeze. And that must have been what happened because he because I just literally must have just laid there like an ironing board. Um, and he just got on top of me and he just started kissing the side of my face, passionately as well. Yeah, it's sickening to think about. Yeah, it was passionate. It's like he, he must have he must have fancied me. Maybe he's just gay. He might have just been a gay lad. That's another thing. that I don't know if he's gay or if he's a predator or whether or not. He just experiment. Who knows what the fuck happened. But anyway, he got I, on top I, of me. I'm going to suggest he was all of the above. Yeah, probably. Who knows if he carried on doing it, if it was his first time, 20th time, if he's doing it now, if he's dead, you know, in jail. No idea. But he gets the side of my face and I froze stupidly again then I'm thinking fuck why didn't I stop that and now it's gone on for too long so I kind of just got to put up with it um, and somewhere along that journey <laughs> journey is a fucking interesting word to call it but somewhere along that because he must have been kissing my face for a good 5, 10, 15 minutes like, and you're not just, just my face but my neck and just, just like and you're hump, just and, and humping me as well and you're frozen frozen yeah so I was literally like this and he was trying to like get to my mouth and I was you know you know, trying to, you know, very obvious kind of, I don't want this. Did he have his clothes on at that time? Yes. So he was pumping me as well. So he's basically like, you know, you know what humping is. It's what teenagers do when they're in a consensual relationship yeah, and they're the yeah. same age. You, sit, yeah, you yeah, go yeah. to the cinema, you have a, you have a touch yeah, in the film. A little hump and yeah, yeah. Dry hump and a snog and happy yeah, days. exactly. So maybe, yeah, who knows? I, I can't say his side of things. And um, But then the weirdest thing was, about it, which confused me, was 15 minutes in, I made a decision, okay, I'm going to go through with it. And I have no idea why I did that to this day. Um, I should imagine there's probably quite a lot of sexual assault victims or whatever you want to call them um, who probably relate to it. I don't know yourself. Um, but I guess... Did I feel like I had to just to get it over and done with? Um, did I feel like I brought it on and maybe I had, you know, I had to now because I'd sort of put myself in that situation? So, can you really not remember how it actually felt at the time? A confusion is probably all I could say. Yeah, because I never expected it. I never even contemplated that happening. I never thought about being with a bloke. I never even really thought about being with a girl. You know. So, uh, and, when, and when you say you went along with it, you. Kissed him. No, I didn't kiss him, but we basically did everything else other than sex. I'd rather not say the exact. Okay. But we, yeah, things that things happened between us. Yeah. Um, he started it, and then and then and then I kind of thought I had to do it back. Put it that way. Did he climax? No. Okay, so it didn't get quite to that 
No, he didn't get yeah. to the end. When well, I, actually, I don't I was, know. I don't know if he didn't. He didn't do it in a way that I knew about it. I mean, a lot of rugby boys back in the day, they would fuck around with each other at sleepovers, drunk, and put each other's dicks in each other's mouths and do all sorts of crazy stuff. Right. But it's very different that between two people in a room experimenting. Mm. There's plan about, and then there's actually taking it to the very end where a climax is reached, and then it's sort of okay. Well, that's that's a different kettle of fish mm. completely. So if he's if he's taking it to that extent, be nice to know what he's up to now. Mm. If he's continued doing that, no idea. I mean, I never spoke to him again. I dropped out of stage school because, I, because I get, yeah, because of it. How did that make you feel reliving that? Just, just, um, because, just because you're a, a self-confessed psychopath. It yeah, just, I'm I don't. Just, I'm I don't. Curious. I, I genuinely don't feel anything. There's nothing going on in my body, but it's confusing mm. to still because I, I still don't have the answers around that. You know, and I've never really fully explored it. I've spoken about it a few times, and I've done it. Spoken about it in therapy, but. Because I used to, I used to put my tongue in my dad's mouth mm. because well he he initiated that of me just I've asked you a very personal question there I've asked if this if this guy climax so it's only fair that I no, okay. that I spoke that I exchanged some vulnerability with you just so you know and I'm, I'm not sitting there trying to prize loads of stuff no I don't mind you. honestly I don't it's mind it's just a case of making sense of it so my yeah. dad used to put his tongue in my mouth mm. uh, which I remember at the time thinking well this is odd and it made me feel uneasy. But the more often he'd done it, the more at ease I become with it, and and then it got to a stage where well I would initiate and I would be the one that put my tongue in his mouth because mm. by that stage he's sort of normalised it completely, mm. and uh, yeah, other bits and pieces went on not to the extent what you went through, but then it, but it was my dad. Yeah. But, <laughs> so different stuff. I think I would have yeah preferred yeah. mine than that, yeah than yours. To be yeah, diff- different levels, different stuff. But yeah, just so you don't think I'm just sitting there trying to prize all no, this mate, stuff I, out I, of you. I, no, no, it's no fair that I, sh- that I share yeah, with you because the, the confusion I get that because at what point did I think this is fucking weird? Mm. Uh, where would it have gone if I'd have kept going with it? Yeah, yeah. It was strange. So yeah, so I just thought I'd give you a, a little bit of Pretty my sure. vulnerability as well, just so you know that like we're, we're in this shit together. Yeah, and I should imagine, like for you as well, there's confusion after as well, because after it's like, you know, did did I bring that on? Did I? Did he knew that? No, that was going to happen, and I was, you know. Well, I at, I, I did initiate. Yeah, it yeah. was me putting my tongue yeah, in his mouth. So but then, again, because another question would be is because you left you left drama school, mm. uh, and all of you singing and dancing that all come to a to a, an abrupt end because of the the sexual abuse. Yeah. Is that right? I think what happened is I went to secondary school. Everything was a bit more adult. Although obviously not an adult, but like a little bit more, mm. you know. And I thought, you know, this actually acting, singing, and dancing probably is not going to serve me very well here. And actually, I don't really want to go back there. So, fuck it, I'm fucking it off, basically. So it's a combination of growing up, not really thinking that it was, you know, filling that void anymore. Have you know, seeing that there's a new opportunity to do something different, and also that being the catalyst just to stop it dead in its tracks. And you didn't tell anybody about the the abuse, no. did you? No. And 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 that's also weirdly because I didn't. I didn't. It didn't affect me at all consciously. So after that happened, bit of confusion. Like, have I just done something gay? Have I just been fucking? Blah, blah, blah? That, that went through my head for probably a couple of hours or something. I don't know. And then I never thought about it again. Really? That was that. Oh, so you questioned your own sexuality? I guess it just popped in. Yeah, because I'm thinking, why the fuck did I, you know, suck a dick <laughs> at mm. the end of the day? That's not something a straight guy does. But I guess it is if you are in a sex, you know in a position where you're being abused and you're being manipulated to the point where you subconsciously pass your power over, in a sense, to that person. Had you ever considered sucking a no, dick in your never. life until it was forced upon you? Never. I mean, I was at the age where I wasn't even sexually attracted Aware. to people, you know, at all. Mm. Um, but, yeah, that, that did cross my mind after. It didn't cross my mind over whether I was gay, but it questioned my mind, did I do that? Did, did I just mm. meet some guy, go around his house and do some sexual stuff with him? Mm. You know, and did he just try it on with me and did I just allow him to do it? And was I all right with that? You know, fuck, I had no reference point, you know? Um, yeah, that's definitely a what the fuck just happened there moment. <laughs> yeah, and you are going to mm. think about all sorts of things. Yeah, you're of trying course. to like, is it that? Is it this? Is it that? And then I came to the conclusion of I haven't got a fucking clue, so let's just not think about it. Mm. And that was probably the first or second, I guess, suppressed trauma. So like, dad doesn't love me, mm. suppressed. Sexual abuse, suppressed. And then this is the time where I enter secondary school, a new world. No one knows me. No one knows that I was a ballerina. Ripped up that newspaper. <laughs> and I was like, 
I didn't. I don't know if I consciously made this decision, but I just was the bad kid, naughty, fucking lighting fire, smashing windows, ex, you know, getting excluded. Eventually got expelled. Got an ASBO. Just a fucking nightmare. Absolute nightmare. Then was it from the abuse that the disruptive behaviour increased and the and the yeah. violence come into play? The violence didn't come until much later. Um, so, but it was definitely the behaviour. So at this point, I'd lost that significance that I needed, that I wanted so badly, because I wasn't doing the acting, singing, and dancing anymore. So I needed to find a new way of getting it. Um, so I was deliberately causing trouble. It wasn't, oh, I just, got, you know, we were hanging around with some lads and we, we got, you know, into some shit and blah, blah, blah. It was, I was looking to cause shit. Um, I was lighting fires. Like I said, I was stealing things. I was, um, I would smash, smashing windows was my thing. I used to get a bit of a buzz out of smashing windows, but I also did it because I, it's a big lot of attention, right? Um, I stole the bus hammer of the back of a um, bus with the little diamond tip, you know, we can shatter glass just like that. And I, and I'd walk, I walked for a four mile stretch from Hemel Hempstead to King's Langley, it's four miles, and I smashed every single bus stop window on the way. So it must have been, I don't know, 30 or 40 bus stop windows, just trying to get nicked. And how old were you at this age? 12, 13. Foolish behaviour, but that's, that's, that's inner anger and frustration because of what you've experienced and you can't make any sense of it. Mm. I mean, we can make sense of it now looking help. back. It's a cry for help as yeah. well, I think. My parents got to the point where they just accepted that I was just this bad kid. And when they did the ring fencing thing, they just, I, you know, didn't care anymore. So, you know, I get expelled, let us come home, get arrested, come pick me up, take me home, wouldn't say a word. They just, they gave up on me. How many schools did you get expelled from? Just just one, and then I didn't go back. Was it a case of just being insubordinate, you just won't take orders from anyone? Yeah. I, well, well the, the reason I got expelled from school, the words on it was refusing to accept the authority of staff. And I think that's part of the psychopathy. Or the, we'll get onto the actual diagnosis of that properly, because there is a diagnosis that I had, which isn't psychopathy, it's antisocial personality disorder. And that one I very much relate to. And there, there are characteristics that I have. And you can use them for good or bad. You know, and I use them for bad, but now I'd like to think I use them for good. Um, but I don't see any, and you're probably the same, and there's a lot of people that are the same with that. I don't see this hierarchy of power. It, I don't understand how other people do see it. Like teachers, Politicians, police officers, prison wardens, they're people. I, I, I don't get how they are anything else other than that. Um, and I've always been like that as a kid. So that's why I didn't, that's why I kept on getting into trouble because t teachers would tell me off and I'd say, fuck off. <laughs> Funny enough, I was very much the yeah, same. I, I, could, imagine. I, I just couldn't, I mean, looking back, I should have maybe had more respect for my elders than I did. But then again, I didn't have the best role model. No. Well, so, I, yeah. so let's talk about the violence because the documentary is is firmly based on the level of violence, the frequency, the extent well, of violence. To be fair, I was talking to you about this on the way out, right? I don't ever want to be the guy that kind of shares the war stories of how how many fights he's had and and how many how badly I beat someone up or how good I was at that fight at that time or... Well, because... can we say then, for, for the record, this isn't Lewis bragging yeah. about his war stories. This yeah. is me probing and he's reluctantly going to tell yeah. us because th these are the details that people want to hear. And also, there's going to be a lot of people that have done exactly the same thing and probably still do the same thing because they didn't have that awakening where... Because something has obviously happened, which we'll get to, something yeah. has obviously happened in your life where you've detached yourself from the old Lewis, the violence has stopped, it had to stop, and then you've created something absolutely remarkably beautiful now and you're helping hundreds of thousands of people. But to put context and perspective, it's good to know just how extreme you were. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like there was a there was a problem. You had, you had a, a serious issue. But it was also another thing that... that disturbed me and I actually found it quite upsetting so I know that I'm not a psychopath okay and it was looking at you yeah you look very different to how you look now but there was videos on the Netflix documentary and you were black and blue looked like you've been beaten senseless your teeth were missing in some video clips there was just so many images and videos of where you've been beaten up and then 
you made reference to like people jumping you and kicking the shit out of you and you just let them do it. And that I found really upsetting. I thought, cool, you've got to be in some in some space just to let go and let someone give you a hiding. Mm-hmm. When you're also more than capable of defending yourself and protecting mm-hmm. yourself. Yeah. So just try well, to make start sense there, of that. Let's start yeah. there then. Because so I was in I was powerless. You know, that's how I felt. You know, dad you know, he's hitting me, sexual abuse had happened, you know, everyone is turning their back on me, I'm getting rejected, I've got an ASBO, everyone's telling me I'm bad. So I've kind of created this identity that I'm this bad and unlovable kid and I've got no control over my, myself, no control over what's happening to me, so I'm feeling powerless. And every time something significant happens in any form of trauma, I'm just freezing, I'm shutting down. And I was very leery, very gobby, wasn't scared of anybody, so I would put myself in situations where... I'm going to get, usually you'd get into a fight, but for some reason I I was, I guess, scared to fight back because I'd never done it. And I was in that freeze because I was just remembering my dad, you know. Again, this is none of this stuff was going through my mind at the time, mm. but you can look back on it and kind of go, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, that's why I was doing Um so I would, I would, yeah, I would prefer to just fall to the floor and just let them kick the shit out of me, but I had, didn't, mob, didn't bother me. Like, I didn't mind... I didn't mind getting beaten up. There's something about it. I don't know why. But I, yeah, I guess it was like self neglect or self sabotage or even self harm. Mm. Um, I guess I was doing that in a different in a different sense. I wasn't self harming, but I was putting myself in situations where I would get jumped. So yeah, I would I would get beaten up, but I couldn't fight back. Was you provoking the people that jumped you? Yeah, yeah. I got jumped a number of times, and that was kind of normal. And I just yeah did, didn't fight back. Also, didn't really know what I was capable of as well. I was tall, but I was really skinny and kind of never really saw myself as a tough guy. So just kind of thought, oh, whatever. I'm the cocky one, you know, I'm not the hard one. But then I went to um, like a, I had like a fake idea. I got into a a nightclub and I think I was 17. And um, it wasn't a fake idea, it was someone else's idea. And um, this guy had jumped me with his mates a couple of weeks ago. And I see him on his own. And I, I walked up to him. And this is going to sound like bollocks, right? But I accidentally punched him in the face. <laughs> Involuntary. How clumsy. <laughs> yeah. no, but I just stand in there. And next thing, the, my fist had crossed his face. It was, it was like subconscious fight back. You know, it's ready to, you're ready to fight back. I didn't mean to. I didn't want to. Didn't even make a choice to. It happened so quickly. I just punched him in the face. We got into a fight. And I, I won the fight. I and mean, it wasn't particularly gruesome. Just had a couple of punches on top of him. And then the bouncers kicked me out. And I just felt like I won the fucking gold medal at the Olympics. Like mm. I was, I felt so fucking powerful. I had the biggest smile on my face. Um, and, and at that moment, I'd latched on and I was like, there it is. You know, that's my significance. You know, I, again, didn't cognitively say that. I didn't think there's my significance. But I just, I felt something that I was trying to fill in these various areas my whole life and I'd felt like I'd found it. And was that the first time you'd ever fought back? Yeah. So you now retaliate, you now find your strength, you get pa- you draw power from it. Yeah. And is this was that the bit like the first that was line a of switch. Like the first line of cocaine. I've got a taste for this. It was abs- after that I could this is the bit where I'm gonna just give it to you now and I'm gonna get shit in the comments for being a liar, but I'll tell you the truth. In the documentary, I underplayed it by a hundred times. And also, I invited a couple of my old mates to the premiere, right? <laughs> and so I've got my couple of old mates mixed with all my community members and things from the coaching and academy that I've built and everything. And a few of them were talking to my old friends because obviously it's like insight into what I was actually like. And they were saying, you know, was Lewis really like that in the documentary? And they were like, <laughs> that is nothing. Lewis was a lot worse than that. And that's what they, they were saying to everybody because the truth is I was fucking crazy. Um, I was mentally ill, I think. Must have been. Um, I would deliberately go out wanting to fight. Um, I wasn't attacking people on the street for no reason, but I was looking for any excuse um, to fight someone. Um, and I would have... I, I'm not jo- I'm not joking. I'd probably have had... If I was to try and put a number on it, and this is... Oh, the, I, I don't want to... I almost don't want to say it just because I know the backlash, but I, I'll have to find some some people to back me up. I, pr- I reckon I've probably had 300 fights at like that kind of level. Like I would have multiple on one night. Like I said on the podcast before, 
This is, I've done this a few times. I'd go into a club, have a fight, it'd get, and it'd be nasty because there'd be blood, there'd be clothes ripped off. And I'd find a homeless person, give him a fiver to get his T-shirt so I could put it on and then, like, you know, push my head to the other side and get to the back of the queue so I could go back in, carry on fighting. So I would ha I'd rack up multiple fights in a night most of the time um, because I just genuinely, I liked it. Mm. That's the truth. I liked I liked it, pretty much everything about it, from the way that it made me feel, from the power that I got, uh, from taking my anger out, from winning, from losing, from getting hurt, to hurting them. Loved it all. So I was, I become addicted to that. Was it always when you was out drinking that the violence would start? Mainly, yeah. I mean, obviously, every now and again, from the consequences of that lifestyle, it would happen. You know, because it happened, so knocked into someone or something. But most of the time, yeah, it was. Did you ever have an arranged fight? You got a beef with somebody. I'm going to meet you at three o'clock there. We're going to have a fight in the car park. No. So I, I was a dirty fighter as well. I'd hit. So I'd just run up to them from behind, smash them with a glass, or I'd, 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 they wouldn't see me coming. <laughs> That's mm. the truth. Like, no. Would, no you, would you entertain someone like that? Would you? Would you enter into a bare knuckle fight? Well, like now, or yeah. back then. Back then and now, I suppose. I never thought about it. Never thought about it. Yeah, but yeah, probably. You know, you got you've got fighting men that they live and breathe, and they're, they they're constantly thinking about fighting. Yeah. And then you've got violent men. Yeah. But don't get me wrong, though. The people that I wanted to fight were the were the people that were like wanted to fight the big ones. The, you know, the ones that thought you know they were hard. I'd look for the ones you know that. I felt like I wanted to put them in their place, kind of thing, you know. And so, when was the first? You obviously, I mean, you can't, you you cannot have three hundred fights and not go to jail. Yeah, I obviously did get nicked a load of times, but most of the time they never called the police. Back in those days, or whatever situations I was in, I would just get kicked out. Well, you do get a lot of clubs that, that if they can deal with it in house, they yeah. they don't want licensing coming in, giving them a strike. Exactly. I'd get beaten up by the bouncers, but I'd fight bouncers as well. Like, that's another thing that I'm going to get grilled for. But my mates will tell you that because that, that was another thing. I'd fight the bouncers. I'd, I'd love that as well. So come, I'd come fight out on top. All, I have some few times, yeah. Because uh, like they they get on the radio, you've then got four of them on you. Yeah, but I love that. I used to fight the police. I've been I've been arrested for fighting police. I, I won't stop until you. I can't. Do any, I can't move. <laughs> when you're in, you're in. Like, like, when, when I got arrested for, fight, for punishing a police officer, um, they had to put leg restraints on me because I was kicking them and everything. They literally had, had me, like, you know, had, had like eight of them carrying me with my leg restraints. <laughs> it's in the, I've got paperwork for it. It's in, the, it's in the documentary. It says, like, we had to, you know, restrain Lewis due to him by act, acting violently and stuff. Well, I thought you supplied some credible receipts in that documentary because mm. you also had friends in there. Uh, confirming everything you were saying. So when, yeah. So when you when you say you've probably had three hundred fights, I don't doubt that for a second. I mean, if you're addicted to something, you you don't do it once or twice. Mm. You keep doing it and doing it and doing it until you reach rock bottom of whatever that habit is. Mm. So the first time you went to jail, what was that for? It was a pretty mild thing, really, and it was um, it was kind of just as the violence was kicking off. Um, but it wasn't for violence. It was actually, it's not, we won't get into it too deep because it's just a waste of time, I think. But I found a car key on the floor and stupidly, I just put it in my pocket. Before I put it in the pocket, I pressed the button and it went beep beep and I realised there was a van there. So I was like, okay, I'll have that. Went and got drunk and then we were going uh, to a mate's house and I couldn't fit in the car. So I was like, oh, don't worry, I've got a van. So I drove the van, didn't even know how to drive it, managed to just about figure it out. It was in like second gear. <laughs> And then as I was going around the roundabout, a police car flashed up and uh, turned out that that car had been stolen in a burglary. And the, the geezer had obviously just stashed the key and thought, oh, fuck that, it's not worth it, and, and kept whatever else. So I got arrested for burglary. Well, actually, I had a police chase and smashed the car into two parked cars and ran away and then tried to jump over a fence and they caught me and I had weed on me as well. And uh, I got arrested for burglary. Um, aggravated vehicle taken, possession of cannabis, driving without a license, driving without insurance, something else, and then yeah, got went to jail for three months. Any young offence? I gave you three months for that. Yeah, it was my first serious offence. You know, everything before that was you know criminal damage, fires, stuff like that. So that was my first. So oh, you're using to use a pyromaniac? Not really, no. But I just that was just one of the things. You know, I just 
Anything destructive, you was in. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, the reason why I only got three months for that is because um, I was good at putting on a good image. Mm. You know, I, I would put a suit on to go to court, you know, and I'm a white lad. With, I'd slick my hair to the side and I could, you know, look like I'd made a big mistake. And how did you find jail the first time you was in there? Because you've gone from fighting, yeah. fighting on the streets, drunk as a skunk, drinking neat vodka. Yeah, yeah. But now, now you're sober in an environment full of people similar to you. Yeah. Well, so young offenders, I don't know if you, you know, if you've had any experience of it, but it's not a nice place. Um, and they put me, the first prison I ever went to was uh, Wood Hill, um, mm -hmm. double A cat, 2A. And it was a young offenders unit within Wood Hill. And it was full of the most, some of the most severe um, teenage criminals in, in the country because of the double A cat. But it just so happened to be close to where I lived. Um, it was in Milton Keynes, and I was, you know, 15 minutes away from it or something. So they just stuck me in there while they were waiting for me to like, put me in my category. Oh, you were a double A cat for stealing a car. <laughs> yeah, it did, yeah. And I was genuinely with people that, uh, that uh, they, the, the two people I remember the most, or the, one group and one other person. Because there's people in there for murder, like 18 year olds in there for murder and shit like that. Yeah. Right, it's terrorists. It's, well, it's probably. A, it's a double A. Yeah, I mean, yeah, whether or not they were in my wing, I don't know. But I mean, at the time, at the time, Charles Bronson was in there. Ian Huntley was in there in the same in the same jail, not my wing. Um, anyway, so there was the there was the three lads from Liverpool. I don't know if you remember. There was, there was the three lads from Liverpool who kicked this old man to death through his helmet. He was, he was cycling. He was like eighty years old cycling. They kicked him to death so hard through his helmet that they killed him for a fiver. They were in the wing. There was this Welsh guy who was the top of the wing um, and he was supposed to be top of the wing for like killing a couple of geezers. And then when I got out, I Googled his name and it turned out that he um, he was homeless and there was this midwife that had just retired and she was like known in the area for delivering like the most babies, like this lovely lady. And she actually took him off the street and said, do you want to stay with me tonight? Because, you know, you're, you're 18 years old. She didn't say that, but you're a kid. You know, come on. And in the middle of the night, first night, he burgled her house. She caught him, so he stabbed her to death 30 times. Not just once, not just 10 times, but 30 times. And this is just a guy that was just floating around in the wing. So this, this fucked me up a little bit because I'm around all these people and the first thing they say to you when you're in prison is, what are you in for? First thing. Mm. And I'm creating this belief system like, oh, I'm not significant anymore. I'm now a piece of shit. Like, people are almost looking at me like, oh, you're in here for a fucking robbing a car. Oh, you're, th on. you're thinking, oh, I'm only a low-level criminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And pe people are bragging about their, their crimes. And, and you go up in the pecking order, the, the more severe the crime. It's just as simple as that. And um, if you're around those people for months, you absorb the same beliefs. And I kind of already had that anyway, but it just amplified it. Um, Did you every have any fights in there? Yeah, I had a few, yeah. Not too many, though, because I... To be honest, I was a bit out of my depth. I was going to say, like, did you feel any fear in there? Didn't feel necessarily fear, but I knew I was out of depth. So I was trying to play it strategically. You know, I was still sussing the whole thing out. You know, I didn't know really what, how things were going to pan out. But there, there was times where I knew I had to prove myself. For example, I was standing up on the wing one day and some guy had come behind me and, you know, remember the word granddad when you kick the back of their sort of leg in and it makes you fall down a little bit? Granddad. I used to call that something else, but I know right. what you mean, yeah. Did that to me and I thought, fuck, I'm going to have to prove myself. So I kicked him down the stairs. That was like the first thing I did. And then that was like, Did, okay. did you say, great, granddad? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like the first little thing. There was lots of lots of confrontation, lots of like issues that I had to deal with, like people robbing stuff. And... But, they, but the lucky thing is they kind of shipped me about. So I went to three different young offenders during that three months. So they sent me to Only and... You was on tour? Yeah. I don't know why. I think, well, the first one is they just send you one that's local. Then they, they categorise you. And then I think then they resettle you. So they send you somewhere that's close to the home again. So they do this fucking full circle thing. I don't know. It's just stupid. They just constantly do it. I, I've been to, I think, five, six different, five different jails. Let me ask you, you know the guy that... Stabbed the woman 30 times, yeah. murdered her for no good reason at all. If, when you was in that Young Offenders, if you'd have known that he'd stabbed the woman, an innocent woman, 30 times, would you have done anything to him? No. What about if there was a nonce on the wing? Would you have done anything to him? No. 
No, it's just got to be. Really, got to even be. though that technically happened to me, I got no revenge. There's, no. There, was, there was no like need for revenge in there. There was a subconscious um, anger towards the world, I guess. So maybe it was there, but I, it wasn't. I wasn't aware of where that was coming from. So yeah, that's what I was thinking. That was were you were you were you carrying bitterness towards certain types of people because of your past no. experiences? Well, so if you want to skip ahead to the last time I went to jail, then yeah. Let's bookmark that. All right. So when you come out of jail mm. after the first stint in there, yeah. did you come out feeling you never want to get in trouble again or did you come out and think, I like this? It was the worst thing they could have done to me because they'd given me the worst punishment society had to offer. And although it was obviously a bit hectic at times, I kind of enjoyed parts of it. And it also put me around people where I've now felt that my behaviour wasn't even bad. And it created that belief system that the bigger, bigger, bigger the crime, the better. Um, and I did just feel hard. Like I felt I was, you know, I, there was a really cringy moment in the documentary where it was highlighted something that I said in a statement to a guy before I fucking bottled him. I said to him, you don't want to mess with me. I've been in prison because at 18 years old, right? You come out of prison. I came out of prison. I did feel hard. Like, I'm not going to deny. It. I did feel hard. I was like, I've been in prison. They'd sell rosemary beads in there. One pound twenty seven on the canteen list, and everyone in everyone in young offenders wears these rosemary beads. Not because they're religious, but it's just like the only fashion fucking jewelry you can have. And I'd wear them on the street, and kind of you know, there'd be other people that have them, and I'd be like, I'd be in jail. And like, yeah, yeah. So it's pathetic, absolutely pathetic, but. It's all I had. I have nothing else. That was my identity. That was what fueled me. That was my only aspiration. Was your mum and dad pleased to see you when you come out of jail? Can't even remember. But no, it was just like they didn't say anything or acknowledge it. It was just they'd given up me at that point. My mum said, "We all know you're not going to make whole bones." Mm. And she'd she'd accept that I was going to die young. The, the, the drinking, the drug taking. Oh, yeah, the more the more extreme violence is that when this now starts. Yeah, so just before I went to prison, actually, I'd started to drink a lot and I'd started blacking out and I'd just I used to get really funny on whiskey as well for some reason. Whiskey just turned me. Um, I drank a bottle of Jack Daniels one night, and um, oh, this is a big part of the story actually. But I, I found a girlfriend for the first time. <laughs> I always say found a girlfriend. It's such a psycho there thing you to are. say. <laughs> 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 got me. Um, but I, I found a girlfriend in the street. No, I got myself a girlfriend. That's, even, that's not even the right way to say it. You met a girlfriend? I met. There you, we go. You met the love of that's, your life. That's how you're supposed to say it. I met this charming, beautiful lady. Anyway, we could, it was on MSN back in the day. But anyway, we met together. We got together. And she kind of felt that filled that void. You know, I did actually feel, oh, my God, maybe I'm a bit lovable. You know, maybe I'm not that bad. And I went around to her family's house and they would like sit in front of the TV and they were laughing and joking and bantering and they made me dinner. I was like, oh, my God, I, 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 this is a family. Mm. She had she had uh, three sisters, one brother, all lived in the same house. It was like this big house. Um, and I was like, holy shit. So I was like obsessed with her trying to get around there like every day. Um, did fall in love with her. So there you go, another psycho thing. We'll have to explain that love part a bit at some point. But I did fall in love with her, but in a, probably quite an obsessive way on reflection. And how old were you at this stage? 17, 18, just like just before I went to jail. Before the young offenders? Yeah. And I got drunk one night and I was being abusive in some way, but not not physically, but just probably like, ah, oh, fuck off, you something, something along those lines, you know. And she went, well, you know what? I cheated on you. And it's probably to this day like my biggest trauma because it just fucking broke me. Like I, 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 I literally, you know the word see red? I don't mm -hmm. know if you've done that. Um, I saw red. I went, I lost it. I just blacked out. And um, I, I, I can only imagine, you know when just before you die and everything flashes before your eyes? I had that, but it was all my trauma. Just... <laughs> Because she'd just taken, I felt the loss immediately of her because I knew that we, you're never going to get back with someone that's done that to you. So, and it confirmed that I was this bad and lovable kid and kind of the rejection that my family had ring fenced me and all that shit that I didn't really understand. I kind of just, it hit me at the same time and it confirmed it and it kind of made it make sense. And it really just put the nail in the coffin of you are bad. In one second that happened. And then 
fucking hell, I, I lost the plot and I did see red and I just went manic. Don't really remember this in massive detail, um, but I've obviously read all the reports. And um, I started, went into her kitchen, my mum, her mum's house. So I smashed her mum's kitchen, ripped up all the doors, pulled out, pulled out, ripped up all the uh, cupboard doors, ripped out the drawers, just acting manic, uh, screaming, shouting, God knows what I was saying. And then when I pulled out a drawer, this six inch kitchen knife just fell on the floor and I had no intention of doing anything with it, but it was like that impulse thing where I'd punched that guy again and I picked it up and I just went and slit both sides of my throat. And by the way, on the the, the, the last podcast I did with James English, I had everyone, fucking everyone in the comments going, what do you fucking do? Slit your knife with a fucking daddy lion? Because there's no much, but can you, can you, which, can oh you yeah, see? very visible. Yeah, okay. So, and there's one under here, but it's covered in a tattoo. Yeah, no, I can see, I can see that clear as day. Yeah, there. Well, there you go, you fuckers. Yeah, he's definitely, definitely slit his throat. <laughs> so it was only a clip. It both, wasn't like, it's not sides. like, a, it's not like I went, oh, oh, and you know, but it was a, it was an impulse, self-harm, fucking crazy, and it, sp and it clipped an artery and I did. Mate, considering that was about, what, 15, 14 yeah. years ago, considering you'd done that 15 years ago and there's still two very visible scars either side of your throat, you must have given that a good go. I guess so. You I must mean, have a sharp knife. When you slit your throat, was you thinking, I'm going to kill myself no. in front of you? No, no, no. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. Was you drunk? Yeah, I was drunk, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I genuinely don't know what I was thinking. I wasn't thinking I'm going to kill myself. I think in a twisted way, I was probably thinking I'm going to fuck shit up right now and um, and uh, make you may, maybe make you feel bad, maybe. I actually don't know. Can't put it into words. And do you think she actually did cheat on you? And because they were just words to... No, I think she did, yeah. Um, and then I lost the plot. So I was probably having some sort of psychotic ep episode at this point because uh, I, the paramedics arrived and I started to fight the paramedics. That's not something a fucking sane person does. And in the end, um, eventually, I let them take me and I was screaming. And I was crying, actually, by the way, at this point, because I could cry out of like, well, I guess this was sadness, actually. So there, so there have been times where I have cried. You know, I'm not completely fucking dead inside, mm. but it has to be something extreme. But I was screaming and crying and saying, let me die, let me die. So so maybe at that point I kind of had enough. So at that point, once I'd done it, maybe I was like, yeah, I will die. And I wouldn't let them um, stitch me up. So it was claret absolutely everywhere. And in the end, they actually had to pin me down to stitch me up because I wouldn't let them. And they had to sedate me and all that sort of stuff. And I was just crying and crying and crying. Let me die. I wanted to see her. I was just obsessed. Oh, I want to see her. Where is she? I need to see her. Um, and then when they kind of, like, kind of stitch my neck up um, and I'd kind of simmer down a little bit and they were gone, ripped the cannula out of my arm and ran out of the hospital and ran, it wasn't far to a house, ran up to a house wearing the prison gown covered in claret with fucking two bulbous, because obviously when you first get your neck stitched up, it's like, they stitch it like that. So I've got these like Frankenstein kind of like bulbous. And um, I knock on her door and she opens it. But I've got nothing to say. So I just literally stand there staring at her. <laughs> she must have been fucking freaked out. And then she called the police and the police come and section me on the Mental Health Act. Mm. and uh, sent me to... Um, you can see why. Yeah, I guess so, <laughs> yeah. And um, this is this is another thing that sounds like bullshit, but they put me in a padded room because I was just, just hysterical. At this point, I was just crying. And you had just slit your own throat. Yeah, so that does make sense. Uh, and, and, and I was violent, so they must have obviously wanted to protect themselves to a certain extent and also stop me from hurting myself more. So I guess a padded room actually does make sense. I always look look back on that thing and think, I can't believe they put me in a padded room because it's so extreme. It's almost like being put in a straitjacket. <laughs> but actually, I, it, 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 I guess it does make sense. But the mad thing was the next day, they just said, um, are you all right now? I said, yeah, I'm feeling better now. They said, have you got someone that could pick you up? I said, yeah, my mum. And then she let me go. That was it. And my mum picked me up and she didn't say a word driving home. I suppose, what do you say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What, what do you say? My mum didn't have the capacity to handle that. I'm sure she would have liked to. I think she went, oh, what have you done? I think that was the only thing she said. You hurt yourself again? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all she said. Oh, God, Lewis, what have you done again? Oh, get in. You know, and then driving home. And then that was it. There's going to be a lot of people watching this that have felt that 
jealousy, heartache, sinking feeling. I mean, for a man, if you love a woman, the thought of another man inside them is... Uh, it's unbelievable pain, isn't it? Mm. It's, like I said, I've had many traumas and more that I haven't even listed off yet. But that one really affected me the most out of everything. Mm. Yeah. And, and and you wouldn't think it because it's like, and people will always say, oh, it's just young heartbreak. It's, it's all right, you'll get over it. But there's more to it if you've got underlying issues mm. attached to it. You know, and for me, like I felt unloved and that confirmed it. And I felt rejected, rejected from a young age my family and she rejected me as well and so there's many other things that you know that can that can feed into heartbreak to make it you know unbearable which is why a lot of people you know kill themselves when they split up with their partners it's heavy it's a it's a, it's a bereavement where they if yeah, if, if, you, if your grief. wife is to, if your wife is to sleep with another man she may as well be dead to you because you've lost her there's no mm. there's no coming back from that yeah there's far too much an intimate act to ever come back from and i suppose you probably knew that there and then that this is Irreversible. And that was also everything in that kind of year or whatever. That was the moment where I was like, I am going to fucking go for it, you know. Mm. Did you ever see this girl again? She got, I think she got a restraining order against me, actually. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. So it's it's, it's always good to be safe. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when when a fucking guy knocks on your door covered in Mm. claret and doesn't say a word... It's probably a good idea. I wonder if she's looking at you now as a multi-millionaire thinking, maybe I'll give Lewis a quick call. Yeah. <laughs> it's a shame things didn't work out. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mind, I didn't mind the, 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 uh, the next slitting that bad. I can look past yeah. that. He's off his head, but he's got a few quid. Funny enough, she actually met some fella like really quickly after me and I was hoping it was going to be a rebound. She ended up marrying him, having kids with him, been with him ever, ever since. That don't surprise me. But she thought, thank God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not... Stop raving mad. <laughs> he at the time though, I think he's matured now. But he was a bit of a he was a bit of a head case. We nearly had a fight a few times actually. The particular guy. Or what after? No, like before. We just he was. I knew him. Oh wow! Well, so she's she's got a type. She likes a nutter. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of girls do. Mm. Unfortunately. I don't know so just so, sorry. Just so I've got the order. Separated with the missus, yep. slit your throat, sectioned, yep. then you got done for TDA, yep. then you've done the young offenders. Yep. Now you've come out of the young offenders. How did you enter back into the world? I just wanted to fight. Um, I started selling drugs at this point and started taking them. That was the, So I didn't take uh, Coke until I was 18. And <laughs> that probably sounds young to some people, but to me that was old. I, I'd actually resisted it for quite a while because mm. a couple of my mates were doing it and I was like, mm. I don't know why, but I just, for some reason, luckily, well, not luckily because I ended up getting bang on it, but just took my time with that one, kind of knowing that I had a screw loose and knew, knowing that wouldn't be a good good mm. fucking move for me. But come 18 and um, a couple of my mates started to sell it and I, and I thought, oh, well, I'm going to fucking sell it as well then. And then I took some and then I started tell- taking drugs and selling drugs. I was, you know, making three or four grand a week and I was, you know, I had a couple of lines, a couple of people working for me and I did it quite strategically in a way that I was making good money and I wasn't paying for the coke and um, got a bit of a name as a drug dealer and a violent drug dealer and it fueled me up even more. So that made things worse, but then I started becoming a drug addict and then the, the, the cocaine use made me more violent and that was my drug of choice, that that balance of the... Because I've got issues as it is, but when the when I take the alcohol, all control is gone. All inhibition is gone. I'm just probably my natural self <laughs> without the constraint. Um, but I can become a mess. Uh, uh, with the cocaine, though, I've become more alert, but more aggressive, more charged. But you put the two together, and I've had some good times, and I've you know had a laugh. But when I switch, or when that point, there's a point, and my my, my friends used to say it all the time. There's there's a there becomes a point where I just turn, and my eyes glaze over and they they can shake me and I just cannot respond to them, you know, and I'm just not there anymore. And it's those times where I just go and do something stupid like bottle someone or smash someone's head in or stamp on their head. Or There's been times where I was, like, I've been on top of people punching them over and over and over again and I never know, what, I've never known what's happened to them, you know. Punching them until you're out of breath. Pretty much, yeah. There was a, there was a line of Charlie you done about... Yeah. A meter long. Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to do a lot of drugs. Like I was t- three or four days in a row about eating or sleeping a lot of the time. That's a hell of a line. 
Yeah, well, I'll tell you what that was. It's like I, um, I can't remember what I did now, but I, anyway, I got six months tag and I had a curfew at 10, 10 p.m., which was pretty decent, really, but means I couldn't get on this fucking massive long bender like I wanted to. So I would go to... Um, <laughs> rock. Sport your fun, didn't I? <laughs> well, I, I got around it. So I'd get up at fucking 9 a.m. <laughs> I'd, I'd uh, go and get a sunbed. That was my routine. And then I'd go into Riley's pool club. Uh, it was like a pool club. Uh, and just fucking get absolutely on it all day. You know, from you know 10 a.m. all the way through, like a nice session, uh, and then have to go back home because there's like a little phone thing. They'd call you, literally call you up at 10 a.m. You there? Yeah, I'm here. And they'd obviously have the money or anything anyway. So how big was your drug habit? Because if you can, if you can put lines away like that, yeah, I mean you... it wasn't the best gear in the world. Let's be honest, it was fucking pub grub shit. Um, That's still as good as is mine. Oh, I always wanted to cut it up. <laughs> You should know. <laughs> I was literally buying benzocaine in fucking kilos and cutting it all up and just doing my own gear. It weren't, it weren't great gear, to be honest. If that was decent, I'd fucking... Yeah, I wouldn't have done it like that. So it was pub grub, but it's but it satisfied the market. I remember um, if it was a if it was a three or four-day stretch, you know, I might do 10 grams. I might drink three bottles of vodka. But if it was just one one on one night, probably only a couple of grams, two or three grams. So you weren't, you weren't using drugs every single day? No, but probably four days of the week. So it was like four days, a oh. couple of days to fucking half get back on it, to... Half recovering. Yeah. So there was definitely a problem there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. An addiction, would you say? Yeah, I just wanted to numb and get out of my head mm. and black out. I blacked out every single... I got to the point where I blacked out every single time. I wouldn't remember anything. You should have just gone straight for ketamine. I never took ketamine, actually. It just never happened. Oh, if you like blacking out, you'd have loved that. I would have taken anything. Do you know what? I'm just so lucky someone never offered me crack, heroin. Mm. Didn't take any of that, but I would have. If someone offered me, if someone, if I was on a session one night on cocaine and it ran out, and someone said, "Do you want some of this crack?" I'd have said, "Yep." Yeah, if you're in self-destruct mode, and that's laying about, and that's better. Mm. I'd have been like, "Give me some of that." Um, so I was lucky in some respects, but yeah, ketamine didn't really happen because I weren't really on that like rave scene or um, festival scene or whatever. I was just like pubs, clubs, kitchens, <laughs> and uh, it was mainly just gear. And did you get any grief from any other drug dealers? No. Because I was, because I was, I was kind of interestingly respected because I was a bit crazy. Yeah, they knew it. They knew I was a bit crazy, and the so they left me alone a bit. Even though there was some much harder, much more respected drug dealers, I kind of, I think I was one that they just sort of turned a blind eye to a little bit. You were the live wire. They were just like, Joe, it's not worth it. I think because because so, I, 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 I never got into any brushes with them. So being the local psychopath, that wasn't that wasn't an act. Was it an act? I played into it. No one knew, no one taught me a psycho. You know, I, that was a that was something that I did get diagnosed with, which we haven't even spoken about yet. But I guess actually people did call me a psycho, but it wasn't like a label I had that they, you know that I knew about. And did you wear that badge with pride? Um, I enjoyed the notoriety that I got mm. from being the one that goes a bit too far and don't fuck with Lewis and did you hear what Lewis did last night and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And did it get to a stage where the more your reputation built up uh, as an extremely violent person, did the fights reduce because nobody wanted to engage in that with you? Well, no, because I didn't... No one wanted to engage with me, but I would just stop, punch him in the face. <laughs> oh, so you was literally, I'm going out and I'm going to go and hurt someone? Uh, it would come a point in the night where I'm, like, I'm ready to fight someone, yeah. And is there anyone particular incident where you think I went too far well loads yeah most I would put I would normally stand by every person said that I knocked out so you'd knock them out first then stand on yeah. their head which is which I know is a scumbag move did you ever bite them I did bite someone once yeah that was actually the first GBH I got done for I bottled someone and then he got me in a headlock, so I bit his abdomen. Are you surprised that you've never murdered someone? Um, I'm, if I'd have carried on, I would have probably. Not wanted to, but it would have happened at some point, yeah. Because when I was young and I used to have fights, I, I sort of didn't... I wasn't conscious of how easy it is to kill yeah, somebody. No, yeah, neither was I. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I, I didn't expect to put someone in a, you know, give someone a brain hemorrhage by bottling someone or... One the, another guy that I give a brain hemorrhage, I just punch him once, and I know people that have died from one punches as well. You mm. know, and it's crazy, but you, but yeah, um, no, I don't. I had no consequences; just didn't enter my brain. No, at all. That's what worries me now. I mean, touch wood, I never throw another punch again because I am so conscious now of losing my liberty, and I think no matter no matter how much someone pushes me, 
I'm just not going to react. You bang them once, mm. they hit their head. That is your life over. Even if it's not my fault at all. If mm. I can, if I can get out of it, I'm going to get out of it. And I know someone that was uh, that went that got murder for a one punch. I was in jail with him. He was 17 years old. He'd, he'd just been done for ABH like a couple of months before. He lived in London, went to the old Bay League because he punched some guy and killed him. And it was just like an argument in the street, punched him once, dead. But he went to the old Bay League, but he was wearing a tracksuit and a black eye, uh, just been done for ABH. And they thought they'd make an example of him and gave him a uh, 17 years life sentence for, for one punch. Mm. I mean, of course, it's a life, so it's justified. But at the same time, it's that easy. One punch, and he's you know a lifer, and he and he went in from seventeen, and I was chatting to him when he was in his mid twenties, and he didn't even know what life was, so like he'd never seen Facebook. I remember I said to him, he, you know, sometimes I go out, I put a pair of shoes on, shirt. I said, oh, shut up, Lou, you wouldn't do that. I'm like, yeah, no, <laughs> shirt on sometimes. Oh, Lou, shut up, you wouldn't do that, would you? Yeah. Because his mind is a seventeen-year-old tracksuit wearing kid. Yeah. You know, he hadn't. He hadn't ever experienced like any level of maturity or any development of life that's the thing with Joe and it time stands still it stands still yeah it's crazy but I just want to put a little disclaimer out there because I know that we're talking about the very remorseless kind of cold violence I'm not going to pretend I'm not going to lie I'm going to try to be as authentic as possible because it might help someone out there maybe that has the same condition as me has, has had the same traumas as me um, and also understands that you can be such a fucking fucked up individual and still completely change things you know and as we get further in the story you know i'll get a chance to share some of that but right now if i was watching this i'd be thinking that guy is a fucking scumbag sitting there bragging about the fact that you know he's to stamp on people's heads that's not what you know I, i'm not proud of that no you're certainly not bragging you're just telling it as a matter of fact because it's what you've done yeah and i've got to be honest and i think people admire honesty and transparency um, and also hopefully it will inspire them more that a change is really possible in mm. a drastic way. And looking back, do you think the people that you you severely hurt, I know you say that, you know, you thought that they're up for it. Do you think they deserved the level of violence that was dished out to them? I mean, they didn't deserve it. Um, but to me, it didn't really seem particularly that extreme. I suppose you desensitised yourself to it because of how frequent you were mm. fighting. Yeah, and it was just, like we was, I guess, scummy fighters, you know. So, you know, if, if there was a bottle available or if, you know, someone's gone down, stamp quickly before they get back up, you know. So, I don't know, I, that's how I learned to fight. I didn't really know that, I, I didn't really have any, I don't know, I didn't have a, a, a like a fighting you know, ethical, strong dad to say, if you're going to have a fight, son, make sure mm. you're, you know, make sure you look eye to eye and, you know, when a man goes down, you know, I didn't learn any of that. So where can I get that from? You know, even, I mean, even that wouldn't be the most constructive advice a father could give you. But um, I was just navigating life the best I could and fucked it up and did the complete wrong things. But I had no other reference point, unfortunately. And the last violent act. Yeah. Which is the one that got you back sent to jail, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So talk to me about that incident because that was quite heavy, wasn't it? Yeah, so that one was different because I remember earlier you said something like, were you, you know, hurting people because of, you know, things that happened in your past and they remembered you, reminded you of them or you were trying to get back at them or something, something along those lines. And I kind of said, no, but there was one incident where I did. And um, it was a subconscious thing. But so I was, I was out on a night out and I was getting a taxi back early hours of the morning scraps happen there quite often don't they but um, I as the dickhead I was jumped to the front of the taxi queue and just got straight in a cab without waiting for the queue because I thought I was the fucking above everybody else so I could do what I want and if you've got anything to say about it then we're going to have a fight then <laughs> so uh, that's exactly what happened unfortunately um, it was a 40 year old guy and I was 24 and um I don't really remember this, but I, you know, I kind of remember bits. And obviously, I've read the reports. My mates told me and all sorts of stuff. But he um, he grabbed me by the neck and started screaming in my face. So, and and what I'm about to say sounds like a, a huge excuse, but it's not an excuse. But it's just I want to bring context to why some people behave the way they do. But when I think back to that incident, 
when he did that, I turned around and I punched him in the face. When I think back at that guy that I punched in the face, I can only see my dad's face. I don't know what that guy looked like. Can't remember. Didn't know what he looked like. I was punching my dad in that moment. That is a, That was a real trigger. That was the first time I'd have been consciously triggered um, because that's exactly what my dad used to do, shower in my face and just in it. And I was drunk, f- drugged and, you know, boozed up. And, uh, and the moment he did that, I mean, I was going to fight him anyway because, I mean, if you're grabbing me by the throat, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be in trouble. But in that moment, he reminded me of my dad and I hit him and he just, his head just, boom, hit the, the concrete. And everyone turned around and, and looked because it was just like a thud that you know something was wrong. And uh, I went over to him and then I s- saw the the dark, slow trickle of blood come out of his head that you see in the movies when someone gets shot or something. And I just, I thought he's dead. And I looked to my left and I saw a security camera and I thought, and I'd love to tell you that I thought of a man, you know, but I probably thought of myself and going to prison first. Um, And I knew I was on camera. Was I being manipulative, knowing that this was going to be seen? Or did I have any remorse? I don't know, but I put my coat over his head. That's how much I thought he was dead. Police arrived, paramedics arrived, put me in the back of the taxi. And then my mate came over and I was like, is he dead? And he's like, I don't know. It's in a bad way. I don't know. And everyone's around him. And then the police didn't tell me for like 24 hours because they're trying to get everything out of me and stuff like that um, without telling me. And then um, turned out he wasn't dead, but he was in a coma for three days um, and he had a brain hemorrhage. And um, I got sentenced to GBH and they said you would have got three years. It was section 20, not 18. Section 20 is like without intent. So it wasn't premeditated, basically. So, the and the whole thing, so they would have seen him grabbing hold of you, shouting... Yeah, and yeah. you hitting him once. Hit him once. But, yeah, but all because of all my previous and everything like that, it was like unjustified or whatever. So you went to jail for knocking this bloke out, GBH? Yeah, I would have got three years, but they, you know, you get a third off naturally for pleading guilty. But they said to me, and this is why I'm always so lucky, uh, they said, well, because you pleaded guilty at the scene, we re- you know, we really appreciate that, so we're going to give you half off. So this is like, it kept on being so lenient with me throughout the years. Because those, those four GBHs, by the way, they got dropped down to two GBHs and then... ABH mm-hmm. had a very good lawyer. Um, and then I ended up getting a suspended sentence for it. I didn't even go down for four GBHs. Wow. So how many times mm-hmm. have you been to jail? Three times. Okay. So we're gonna, we've are gonna got to come to the turning point now. So what was your final prison sentence like compared to the others? The, other, the, well, the first time you went in, you sort of wanted to go back as a... As a yeah. A top end criminal. Yeah. How did that compare to the last well, one? Well, the, the first I had, I had a still a weird warped sense of, oh, okay, I've got an eighteen month sentence. This one's actually and for GBH as well. This is perfect because if someone asks, what are you in for? Mm. GBH, perfect, N- nice, nice little level sentence. Enough for people to go, oh, okay, fair enough. Could you believe how, how lucky you were to only get eighteen months for that? Yeah, I was. I was. Yeah, I was lucky. So I wrote my friend and I said. Uh, what are people saying about me? He said, you're on the front page of the paper, boorish and violent. And then I said, okay, what else? And he said, well, your friend has posted a picture of you um, the day you were sentenced outside the, the courtroom. And then a picture seven years before outside the exact same courtroom with the caption above it, nothing changes. <clears throat> and I don't know how that hit home. I don't know how that hit home and how he was the one to do it because he was like just as bad as me. Uh, and he wrote that and I thought, how do you mean nothing changes? Look at, you know, how dare you? But then it actually, then I actually started to think, he's actually right though. Seven years have passed and I am actually 24 years old in prison again. Um, and he just flicked something. And I went back to my prison cell. Here's another cliche story that people are going to, that sounds like bullshit. But I looked in the mirror and in prison, they're these scratched off pieces of metal. They're not even actual mirrors. I couldn't even, I could barely see myself. But I had the most, um, the most kind of like perfect epiphany. You know, the, 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 the miracle breakthrough that everyone wishes that they would have. It doesn't happen for everybody, but I had it. I looked at myself and I just, 
I just got it. I just realized that I was the problem, you know. I looked at everyone around me. I blamed everything and everyone around me for why my life was difficult. And I'd never once thought that the center of all this chaos was me. And the fact that my friend had kind of highlighted like nothing had changed made me look at myself and I realized I was the problem. But I also realized, I always use the word cliche and cheesy because for me it fills it. Maybe for other people watching it doesn't, but I have had a very, very almost unbelievable transform. No, not almost. I've had an unbelievable transformation, mm. you know, and that's why I use the word cliche sometimes because I kind of want to bring to light that I acknowledge that it sounds a little bit far-fetched and a little bit hard to comprehend, but I want people to know this is possible for people. But I just looked at myself for the first time ever and I got the truest reflection of myself and I realized I was a solution as well. And I just realized if I want my life to change, I have to change. Now, that's fucking obvious, isn't it? But I never in a million years thought it, not once. For some reason, change to me was getting a new job, was moving away, was, you know, drinking beer rather than vodka. You know, that was change. <laughs> 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 not, uh, I'm going to... Putting a top in your log up. Yeah, it, it wasn't... Going out, you know, you're, you're going out slightly less or maybe not going to the club, just standing in the pubs. I mean, that, that was a few changes that I tried to make. I didn't know that change within myself was possible. I didn't know you could change yourself. And, and, and in a million years, if anyone was going to change, it was going to be me because I was the fucking one that was beyond help. But I just realised that, no, 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 I can change myself. And I've always been addicted and obsessed with things. So... I become addicted to violence. I was addicted to gambling, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, sex, everything I just abused because I was just using anything I could to fill that void. And anything that got that made me feel good, I wanted a hundred of them. Um, and luckily, the, I just latched onto the idea of I'm going to change myself. And I started having all these fantasies of I'm going to change my name, I'm going to move abroad. I was kind of thinking like the Frank William Abagnale of Catch Me If You Can, you know at this point, you know, because I'm quite become a good person at this stage. So I was thinking maybe I could just, you know, pretend I'm this other person. And it's just this idea developed and I started to go into the maths and English lessons. I started to read. I started to, uh, I've written, rolled myself in a rehab program inside prison. Um, and I just immersed myself in absolutely everything that there was available to change, to give it a shot because I was just going to all in. I'm all in and all out. And um, I started noticing, noticing changes and it blew my mind. I thought, wow, so this works. And then the moment I realised it worked, is again, it was like my first line or my first punch. It was like, mm, okay. So I just obsessively worked on changing myself. And I started to notice how much help there was because I was the typical kind of, oh, no one wants to help me, there's nothing available, they just want to lock us up and all that sort of bullshit. But I noticed... You know, the moment I become receptive to help, it was everywhere. So many things. And it was all life changing in its own sense. Um, one of the things I did was the maths and English. It was functional skills level one and two, which is like the equivalent of a 10 year old. Because I left school with no GCSEs, um, no qualifications whatsoever. And um, I went into the class. And the first thing I did, though, was screw the paper up and throw it. I said, I'm not doing this shit, even though I was the one that signed up for it. Because <laughs> I was just such a defensive, emotionally unintelligent, troubled child, even though I was 24. Um, looking for reasons to be angry. Yeah, looking for reasons to to not do anything. And, and also what I realised was underlying fear. Because Susie, prison tutor, came sat down next to me and she said, Lewis, what's the matter? And I don't think anyone had ever asked me that before. And I just blurted out, I don't understand. But then I thought, so if I, oh, hang on a minute, like, how, how, how could I even say I don't understand? I didn't look at the paper. I haven't looked at the board. I don't even know what she's fucking teaching. So I'm making an, an assumption that I don't understand. And then I'm, I'm starting to just, like piece it together and I'm thinking, and I come to the realisation that I'm scared to prove my dad right. Mm. You know, I'm scared of being this stupid buffoon that I've always thought I was. And this piece of paper, this work is going to prove that. But she supported me to do these like calculations and I did them. And I was like, oh, okay. It wasn't so bad. And then I kept on coming back, doing maths and English, 
that because you can either do uh, work in prison or you can do education. It's like full time during the day in category C. And uh, at one point, I, I thought, do you know what? I'm actually getting this, and I'm I'm feeling quite good about it. So I thought, I was like, can you set me a challenge? She said, all right. Have you heard of pi? No. She's like, it's the circumference of a circle. Blah blah. blah. She explained to me how to do that. She's like, could you learn that? I said, yeah, I'll learn that. And I came back the next day and um, she thought I was going to learn how to do pi, the calculation. But what I'd done is I'd memorized pi to 100 decimal places. And um, I wrote out on the board and she she, she says it's in the documentary, by the way. So this, this could be proved because this is another thing which just sounds like bullshit. But I went out and I wrote out to pi. And I could still probably tell. Uh, and for years I remembered that. And, and then I went back and I actually did 500 after that because I just it filled me up again and I was getting fill, filled up again but with good stuff so I went away and learned pi to 500 decimal places it took me 15 minutes to read it off and for about for about five years I remembered them all it's gone now I could tell you the first 50 probably 3.141 get someone to slow that down and go and check it like that's pi have so, you ever seen a film called Rain Man? I know what film it is, but I haven't watched it. Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman. Mm. Bookmark that. Watch it. You'll well, love it. Uh, he's autistic, right? Mm. So this is why I think some people message me think I'm autistic or uh, Asperger's or but on the spectrum. Mathematical genius. Possibly. I mean, I'm not that particularly good at other. I'm pretty good at some, but it's not like you could give me loads of equations. I don't know what to do with them. But um, I've definitely got um, some logical abilities that that others don't, and I didn't know that I had these. So just for the record, you spent your entire life not knowing you had this very, very special superpower, mm -hmm. it was only until your third jail sentence that you realised that you're extremely unique in that area. Mm -hmm. wow. Even then even then, I didn't really realise it because um, I was still like, oh, this is just basic stuff, you know, because I didn't have anything to compare it to. I didn't know who else could memorise that. Do you, well, you think that was normal? Well, I just thought I did something that was good and I was proud of myself, but I didn't. I thought maybe someone else could do it as well. I didn't. How do I know? Like, I literally, I have nothing to compare anything to. Um, and I said to her one day, I said, Susie, and I, this is, I was almost joking. It was like a really flippant remark where I just, I said, do you ever think I could go to university? And I was expecting her to actually say either no, you're probably not because of your record and everything, or... Maybe if you really try and, you know, get your head down. But she she looked at me dead in the eyes and she kind of looked at me almost like, like, are you, are you joking? And she went, of course you can. And I just, that was the first time I'd ever felt belief in myself from her because she gave it to me. No one, no one had ever believed in me before. Mm. And I'd never believed in myself. Powerful thing. It was. Oh, very powerful. Mm. And I set myself, set myself a goal. I said, I'm going to go to university. Um, and at the same time, I was doing this rehabilitation of addicted prisoners trust program inside prison. And it was it was about drug and alcohol abuse, but it was all it was mainly more about you as a person and you know the reasons why you drink and take drugs and stuff like that. And we were learning about emotions and things like that. And it was personal development things. And I was taking a lot from that as well. And there was a guy that came in to do like a guest talk, and he spoke about this opportunity to go to rehab. And um, I, I thought, if I'm going to go to university, the one thing that's going to stop me from doing that is if I take a drink or drug. Because the moment I do that, the other me or the, the me that I'm trying to c control is going to take over and I'm fucked within moments. You know, as soon as I get released, if I walk into a pub, it's not going to be long before any all of these changes are a complete waste of time. And at the same time, I'd also been reading the Alcoholics Anonymous book as well and like reading through it and relating to so much about it and stuff. So this guy offered the opportunity to go to rehab, but you had to like apply for it. Um, you had to get a grant. It was 20 grand that the government had to pay up for it. And there was only a certain amount of spaces. And I thought, I'm probably not going to get this because I'm not that bad, you know, in denial and all this stuff. Mm. <laughs> Filled it all out and submitted it. And they granted me and I was like, fucking hell. Um, and I was thinking, should I take this or not? Because, you know, I'll go back to release from prison and then go straight to rehab. You know, so that's like quite a t t tough pill to swallow when you want your freedom back. But I, I had an exam, maths and English exam, 
for these functional skills. They actually do exams in jail, so you can actually get real qualifications, and then you can go out and start, you know, maybe getting go to college and stuff. They're not like prison ones because that wouldn't do you much favors, would it? <laughs> I'm looking for a job. I've got this prison qualification, so there are legit. And um, I was going into the exam, and before I went into, it, I punched a wall. What the fuck? I literally think was like, what the fuck have I done that for? I was just so angry. Um, for no reason. No reason. Well, there was a reason. Didn't know what it was. The reason was shit scared. I'm about to find out again if my dad's going to be right. It's going to be on paper this time. But I thought it broke my hand. So the police had to actually, uh, sorry, the prison officers actually had to take me to a hospital because there was no hospital inside this prison that I was in. Um, and uh, I drove past where I was from and I just felt everything come back. Like there was no changes being made. It just came straight over me. Like whew, that's how I describe it. Like a whew, straight back to the day that I went into prison, no changes. And then I knew I can never come back here. So I, I, I took the rehab, they picked me up from the prison gates, took me down to Portsmouth, right as far down as you can go, obviously in the south, on the beach, you know, and I'm from town, village, city. And they fucking broke me down and absolutely rebuilt me into a different person. That's the truth. You know, and it's to cut a long story short, like they, I thought they were going to teach me how to not drink and not take drugs. Not about that. It was about sharing my story. It was about talking. It was about being vulnerable. It was about digging into that trauma. And one of those stories was to share my story. And I didn't even know what that was. So I had to go back to my room with pen and paper and start writing things out. And then when I went into group co group therapy session one day, I, 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 it was my turn to share my story. So I shared it. And then I just looked around and I saw everyone's jaw hit the ground. I thought, oh my God, I'm traumatized. Mm. This is this is significant. And the denial was starting to kind of break down because I didn't think I should even be there. There was times where I wanted to leave. I, I actually was really lucky, but also very unlucky. And the fact that they put because I was a mapper at the time, a multi-agency public protection order. I was one of the. I was. I was known as uh, one of the most dangerous people in the country, essentially, to to keep an eye on because they thought I was going to kill someone. As my probation officer wrote, we've actually missed out a lot. But my probation officer wrote that Lewis is going to kill someone one day, and she actually recommended me for an IPP, indefinite public protection sentence, which is the ones that you get life for. Didn't get it, thank God, but they put me on MAPA instead, which means that you have to keep a strong eye on you. So what they did is they put the rehab as my registered address. And if I left the rehab, I would breach my bail, and not my bail, my probation, and I'd go back to jail. So I was now locked in rehab, um, which is a blessing and a curse because I didn't want to be there, but also at the same time did and couldn't leave. So... It was torture, it was backwards and forwards between this is good, this is bad, but it was tough. Um, I shared my story, realised that I needed to be there, that helped me break down denial, but then I'd slip back into denial again. There was this one time, poignant part of the story, people always find quite funny, but it was a real, a real breakthrough. I've had a few, this was one of them, um, where I had my arms crossed in group coach, a group therapy or group coaching or whatever you want to call it, and everyone was sharing and talking, and I was like, oh, whatever really defensive, really didn't want to do the work, really didn't want to dig deep. And um, I had this, because because I, cause my, like, I felt like my mum and dad didn't really love me or whatever, I could not comprehend that these counsellors gave a shit. Mm. I was like, there's no fucking way. And I literally said to him, you're here for a job, you're here because you're getting paid, you don't give a fuck about me. Literally said that. And I was convinced, like I was so arrogant. Like I felt I knew way better than them. I felt, I, felt, I felt like I could read minds. Like I know you. Never met you, but I know you. Well, none of them ex-addicts themselves. Well, actually, yeah, they were. Because like, they're, they're the ones that care. Yeah, yeah, well, actually, yeah. I mean, they probably all cared, to be fair, because um, you wouldn't do that kind of job. But I just had a defence up. And I said, I don't know what you're trying to do. You're trying to brainwash me. You're trying to brainwash me to be like, good to two-shoes, live that crap life, you know, pretending I didn't want it. And uh, I said, Lewis, your best thinking, your absolute best thinking has put you into prison and now into rehab. Maybe your brain needs a good wash. And it hit home again. I was like, you know what? My best, my, 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 my way does not work. Mm. So I have to do it someone else's way. So I tried their stuff. And if I can start it to work, 
I started to think differently. I started to feel better. Yeah. Did you start feeling more in touch with your emotions and feelings after you'd made a little bit of sense of it? Um, yeah. There was one session um, where it was with a lady who actually shared to me that she used to be a crack addict and, and, and I built this rapport with her and she really allowed me to trust her. And uh, she was talking about my dad. And at this point, I didn't even know that I had issues with my dad. I knew things had happened, but I didn't know that he was like my trauma, like I'd caused any trauma or he was the reason for my anger or anything like that. But she was talking about my dad and I, I was getting choked up. Ah. And she was pushing. I was like, and I said, don't. I said, don't. And she was, it's okay. And she'd asked me a question about my dad. I said, don't. She's like, what was the exact word she said? I think, I think it was, if you, you can trust me and it's safe. Something like that. And it just erupted out with like a tsunami. I just blurted out, why was it so horrible to me? And I just bawled my eyes out and it just clicked. Ah, I've been beating myself up my whole life from, from, from feeling like this bad kid and not knowing why my dad treated me like that. And it, I just felt so much lighter after that. I bet you did, especially if you don't, if you, as far as you're concerned, you don't feel emotions like yeah. love and sorrow and empathy and you, you don't cry. I mean, that must have been big for you. Yeah, definitely. It was huge. And one of the breakthroughs I had once is I told a counsellor that. I said, I, I just actually don't know if I want the alternative of getting myself sorted. <laughs> I don't know if I like that life. Mm. The idea of this nine to five and this, like, not drink, no drugs, I, I can't really get my head around it. I don't know if I want that. You and like extremes. Yeah, I like extremes. But he said to me, how do you know if you've never had it? Oh, oh, you're right. And I thought maybe it's part of me that's pushing this away because maybe I want it or at least I understand it. Because no, what, what, what I'm taking from that is, yeah, you yeah, you had these epiphanies and you were self-developing and you was, in, you was enjoying the support and the moment where you cried for the first yeah. time. But also to me that seems... Is, the more your senses aren't dumbed down with beer and gear, the more you're finding actually who you are and how you genuinely feel. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of had the luxury of it being so bad, that kind of hitting that rock bottom, as they mm. say, that I kind of had to do the work, you know? Did you do the 12-step program? Yeah. I didn't didn't complete it, to be honest. But I was going to say, did you, do the, did you do the part where you have to go and say your sorries? No. <laughs> I'll do it up until that point. I'm doing a couple of the steps. <laughs> the steps that I want to do. I'm going to do a couple of jumps. Yeah. Um, no, the truth is I just didn't get around to it. It's a very long-winded process. It takes a few years properly to do mm. it. Um, I did 90 meetings in 90 days, though. Sometimes I went to five meetings a day when I come out of rehab. I become addicted to those meetings, actually, because that was my support network. Because mm. I was living in Portsmouth. Um, my life went, went to one shit life, to another shit life, to be honest with you, because... I got this, yeah, it was, I, I basically was homeless because I couldn't go back and live with my mum because uh, that's where my old, you know, everything was. So I knew I couldn't go back there. So I had no other op option. So I, Was that just too many triggers there? Too many triggers, lifestyles, everything was just there. So I would have just slipped back into it. I know I would have. So I decided that once I finished rehab, I'm going to live in Portsmouth. Um, so I had my literally 50 pound discharge grant from, from prison. And, uh, whilst I was in rehab, they help you sign on for employment support allowance. I started getting benefits. Then I applied for housing benefit. And then I got this little flat, absolute shithole. It was actually a crack and heroin addict, uh, flat. It was everyone in there was, a, was an addict. There was, I literally had to step over passed out heroin addicts. Cause it was the only thing that I could afford to live on my own. Cause I wanted to live on my own. I think I got like £465 a month that I could spend or something. And that was the only flat because I didn't want to share it with anyone else. Um, so I preferred that. Um, and then I was going to these, I was literally on Friday nights sitting in church halls talking to drug addicts. And then after we might go for pancakes, you know, that was the highlight of my week. And I'd cycle to the laundrette to get my clothes washed on my push bike. But... You know, I was clean and sober, and I and I, and I knew I was right at the start. But I, but I just, I guess, had hope that it, things would get better. And I enrolled into college, and I went in there, and I realised I didn't know fucking anything because these these kids had come straight from school. You know, I didn't know how to analyse or reference or, and this was an access course, so it was like your A levels uh, jammed into one year, so that you can get the, the qualifications to go to uni. 
So it was like this jam-packed intensive course. And I went in there and I was like, do you know what? I don't know anything, but I'm going to try my for, – for, for the first time in my life, I'm just going to try my hardest, no matter what happens. If I come out stupid, and at least I know. And I tried my hardest and – I asked every fucking question. I was the annoying kid. I was just everything. I wanted to learn everything. I would read all the books. I would go to the library. I would cycle there in the rain, in the snow. Like, it sounds like such, bullshit, such a cliche fucking story, but it's true. But I remember there one time where I was literally cycling. It was about a 40-minute cycle. And the, the snow one day was hitting my head, and it was, like, giving me a headache to the point where it felt like I was being stabbed in the head because of the snow was coming in but I was like no no I'm getting and I got 100% attendance for the year so you that was one of my I committed <laughs> but I also got a distinction in every module and every subject and won an award uh, in the college for getting the highest marks in the entire college and it just it just fueled me up and I just it gave me more belief you know now I talk about uh, one of the things I train in the coaching uh, academy that we have is um, the belief cycle it's so simple it's you know you take action um, and then you get a result and from that result it creates an element of belief in yourself. And from that element of belief, it increases the amount of potential you feel like you have. And when you increase your potential, it makes you want to take more action. And when you take more action, you get more results. And when you get more results, you have more belief in yourself. And it goes like that. And and from this point, I'd always, always felt like my life had spiraled out of control. I'd always like think, fucking hell, things were kind of going all right, but now I'm back in prison again or back in a police cell or just been out on a four-day bender again. How, how did I always end up back here? But it was like the opposite happened. It was like things started to spiral into control, you know, because I'd worked on myself and I was doing the right things and I was in the right environment. I was around the right people. And I got into uni and I was three months in. No, sorry, this stepping back. I started to realise that these drug and alcohol meetings were really changing people's lives, including my own. And I was thinking, why is like this not available for everybody? Not just drug and alcohol addicts, but why don't everyone get together and talk about their feelings and mm. share their goals and be held accountable and have a hug when you walk through the door because that's what they do. And this would make the world a better place. So I was like, I'm gonna, I, I want to create something like this for people that aren't drug addicts and alcoholics. But I tried to uh, like get a few people interested in it. No one was interested. Um, because I had to like cover the cost of rent in somewhere, so I wanted to charge thirty pound a month for this group offline. No one wanted it, so then I thought, okay, well I'm going to meet up with some people. So I went online and met, uh, saw some people that were like miserable, and just asked them if they wanted to meet up for coffee. And I even bought the coffee, and I'd sit in front of them, and I would just help them as much as I could. And I helped them for six weeks, four of them, and I changed their lives. Were these friends or randoms? No, randoms, complete randoms. I changed their lives. And not in massive ways, but, you know, helped one lady split up with a toxic partner that was, like, abusing her pretty much. Uh, I helped one lady start a, a pet business that was like a dog walking business, but it was like something she'd always, always dreamed of. she created flyers. She'd put them out. She started making a bit of money from it. I helped one with an eating disorder that she'd had her whole life, and I really, like, got to the core of it and, and worked out that it had come from the loss of her dad leaving her and the fact that she felt like she had control over her diet, therefore she had control over her life. And the moment she had that breakthrough, she I sat there and ate, I sat there and watched her eat a bowl of chips in front of me. And I, so, so I had this ability to to fucking help people. And I realised I'd learned it from all the drug and alcohol meetings, all the rehab, my own personal experience and journey. But I'd also heard everyone's triggers relapses, traumas, denials, stories, limiting beliefs, fears, doubts from all these meetings. And also I'd learned I'd got this very strategical mind, you know. I, I'm not that emotionally tuned, obviously, as we've spoken about. Uh, it's starting to summon up a bit, um, but still way more of the I'm blind, but I can still hear much better thing. So I realised that I had this sort of strategic way of understanding people. You know, and the people could talk to me, and I'd kind of, I know what, know what your problem is, you know, mm. and I know how to get to it. You know, I could see the questions that I had to ask in order to get to that point. You know, and I realised I've been given a gift by my genetics or this disorder, whatever it was. I had a very deep understanding of other people, you know, and I was able to help them massively. So I realised, you know what, I can actually become a life coach. So I went online, did some training, learned some tools and techniques and models and frameworks and um, 
just I don't know why, but I just got it that why aren't we as ever as is everyone doing it online? Why are they not doing it online? People were still meeting up for coffees and doing the network and giving out the business cards to the four people in a room, you know, eight years ago. Like this, it's mad when you really think how quickly the world has evolved because it wasn't like that. The online business actually was not a thing eight years ago. It's it's insane to think. Um, I was one of the first coaches that started getting clients online by posting my story, by sharing content um, from connecting with people. Uh, I was doing um, Facebook video calls with people in America and Australia, whereas all the life coaches in the area were, you know, trying to get clients from their little collective. So I made a uh, hundred grand in seven months, get just to get, bring on as many clients as I possibly could one to one. And that's the, that's your first seven months of your new business. Yeah. And how long had you been out of jail before you started your new business? I think it was less than a year. Because it was like the overlap time during whilst I was also studying as well. So it was less than a year. Which goes to show if you fully immerse yourself and focus on near enough anything you want to do, you can do it in quick time if you commit. You can go from a psychopath to a life coach. Yeah, just <laughs> slap it. <laughs> just slap it. When I, I mean, six months rehab. I, mean, I, had, I had nine months of work in jail. I had six months rehab. Then I did a lot of AA meetings and stuff. Then I went back to college, you know. But I, at the same time, I was kind of helping people and getting immersed in it. And then there was this trigger where I was like, okay, hey, I'm going to build a business and then I'm going to go all in. At this point, I got given a place at university, which I was blown away by. And But I was three months in and I was like, this is fucking boring and this is shit. Mm. And I couldn't believe how simple it was because in my mind, I'd always thought universities for clever kids, so not for people like me. And I thought I would not be able to handle it. You know, I was going to be like, oh my God, there's so many books to read. I'm not going to be able to do it. And then I got there and it was just fucking the most basic bollocks that you could ever imagine. It's incredible that you didn't acknowledge that you was extremely clever. Well, at that point, I was starting to realise it, you know, but I'd never... Thought I thought I was going to get to uni and kind of be like, I'm out of my depth. But I was like, no, I'm not. This is wasting my time because I've built this other business at the same time. So I, was, I had a decision to make. Do I learn this generic information for the sake of learning it? Or do I just learn the information or just take the steps I know I need to take to build the business I've already got? And it was obviously an, it was an obvious decision for me. So I dropped out. You know, people would see dropping out as the worst thing you can do, but didn't drop out. I chose to leave. And by the time that my peers in my cohort, had graduated. I was a millionaire. <laughs> so that's awesome. a good choice. <laughs> that's, up, that's some dropout. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's worth dropping out. So, I mean, Steve Jobs dropped out as well. I think quite a few people, um, quite, quite a lot of successful people realise that, you know, academic education isn't fit. And I've, I could talk about it. I'd love to do another podcast just to talk about that. That is a whole podcast in itself. A hundred percent. And I'm working on changing that. I've got big, big plans on changing that. But that's that's for another conversation. So something we do need to quickly just touch on is this mental health stuff, because mm -hmm. obviously it's a big, big part of this. Um, so when I did that pre-sentence report, we completely forgot to sort of dive into it. But the pre-sentence report, I went in there and I just, she said, you might be looking at eight years in prison. And I didn't know at the time, but she had had recommended me for that IPP, which I didn't realise at all what was, but is a life sentence. And they only let you out when you're deemed safe to the public. And I've met people, I met a guy recently, actually, at an event. And he got a 15-month IPP and he was in jail for 18 years because mm. <laughs> they just basically don't let you out. Uh, it's just, it's been abolished. I mean, it's the same one Charles Bronson's got that's been in for 50 years. I think he got three years IPP and he's been in there 50. If you're still on IPP, that stays, but yeah. it, it can't be. Yeah, yeah. They've, ta they've taken it away now. They, they, they changed it to EPP, which is Extended Public Protection, and I got recommended for that the next time I went to, in my next pre-sentence report. So they was, probation were gunning for me, but mm. the judge kept on being lenient. I could, maybe it was fate that it was more to me because I could still be in jail now. If I'd have been given an IPP, I'd still be in jail now. How fucking mad is that? Um, when you think of the life you lead now, yeah. Yeah, because it would have been a waste. Not and maybe day. maybe judge s sensed that. I don't know. Uh, kept on sensing it. Different judges, I don't know. Maybe the universe had something in, in, different in, in plan for me. In well, for me. A, a judge has enough pieces of shit in front of him to know who's a piece of shit and who actually isn't. But I was a piece of shit. That's the thing. I was a piece of shit. Um, doesn't mean to say I didn't have a potential. Doesn't mean to say I didn't have the ability to change. Doesn't mean to say I didn't have the ability to be a good person. But I was a piece of shit. That's the truth. That's an honest statement. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to change it. 
you know. Otherwise, mm. I'd have stayed the same. Mm. But so the probation officer was shocked at my reaction to the fact that I didn't care about anything she was saying, which was eight years in prison. And, you know, she would talk about the crimes and she's like, how do you feel about them? I was like, nothing. Because I didn't, I didn't even know how to react. I didn't even know how to fake empathy. I didn't even know what empathy was. That was a word that wasn't even my vocabulary. <laughs> but that's not even empathy. That's that's sort of remorse. That's panic, guilt. like shit. I'm going to be locked in a cage for eight years. Yeah. Did, did you not feel no. scared of that? No. Punishment just didn't doesn't register, and neither did the consequences of the other. You know, the victim. You know, that's the tr the truth. I just got to be honest about it. You know, now I logically understand, and I can feel a bit. You know, still got. Obviously, I've had this condition or this trauma that doesn't allow me to fully access it. I'd love to. I'd love to be able to fully access that. Like, I'd love to be able to truly connect on a warm level. Like, I'd love to be able to feel real, true happiness and joy and fulfillment. But the truth is I don't have those. You know, so I, 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 I fulfill those needs with stimulatory excitement type activities such as work. And I do understand love, it, but it's more on a logical level. I, I understand and see love and receive it rather than feel it but the, the guilt and the remorse I didn't understand it at all and I really don't really it's not quite there that's the truth it, I, I wish it was and it makes me sound like a scumbag for saying I don't have it because good guys have it but I, it's not in me well Good guys have it unless they do have a personality disorder, which you're not denying. Yeah, so let's that's, that's talk about it. So I, got, so I went to a, uh, the clinic, uh, the psychiatrist, Dr. Sadler, he diagnosed me with an antisocial personality disorder. I thought it was bollocks. I thought, Mr. Good, Goody Two Shoes, obviously, I've done some crazy shit. He must think I'm crazy, but I'm not crazy because no crazy people think they're crazy. <laughs> It's a problem. It's everyone else. <laughs> exactly. You're all crazy. <laughs> but that, that was it. I was honestly just like, oh, whatever. Didn't think anything of it. But then I did Google it and it did come up psychopath. So the, so an antisocial personality disorder is the clinical diagnosis of a psychopath. But a psychopath isn't a clinical diagnosis. It's just a label. It's just a flippant name that people give to people with those disorders that do end up going right down the spectrum that have, you know, severe traits that have manifested into crimes and things like that. Um, but you can have an antisocial personality disorder and, you know, live a very normal life um, and nobody would ever know. Most people don't talk about it because there's such a stigma about it. No one's going to want to say, hey, how you doing? I'm a psychopath. Mm. You know, because, of course, they won't trust you. Um, they think that you're manipulative. They think you're out to hurt them. They think you could hurt them, be scared of you, all sorts of things. So it's this really marginalised part of society but there's probably the nicest people you've ever met in your life right now. And like one of them might be a psychopath, you know, because they've got great superficial charm. They've got the ability to build rapport and connect because they're reading every part of the situation. They're listening intently. They're using it to feed it back to you in a way that makes sense. And they're lovely. And they do genuinely want to help and be nice and be kind because they understand, understand that that is the good thing to do. And they want to be good. It doesn't mean to say they necessarily feel that. Mm. They don't get like a warm, I want to help you so I can feel warm inside. But they go, I want to be intellectu intellectually, I, I, this is the right thing to do. Does that make sense? Because it's quite complex. No, no, no. It makes perfect sense because I challenge my thoughts and behaviours and my motives all the time. All the time. Because I've been surrounded. I'm... I'm no stranger to a psychopath, yeah. uh, a narcissist, a sociopath. I'm well, not... What about the, what about the ones that are less obvious though? The covert narc, for example. Yeah. Yep, I'm privy to them too. Okay. I know all the little signs. I can spot. I mean, it takes a look. I mean, it can take a while. And 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 the, and the covert narcissist. I mean, you could be married to one for twenty years and still not know until something doesn't feel right and you start googling things because things don't seem right and then you'll start looking at behaviour patterns and then you then you actually start asking yourself. Am I the narcissist? Because if you're dealing mm. with a covert narc, in order to deal with a covert narc, you've got to be comfy being the bad person mm. and then you become narcissistic yourself. Mm. So I've got quite a good understanding of all of this and I've asked myself questions in the past. Am I a psychopath? Yeah. Am I a narcissist? Am I a sociopath? Am I, is this a real feeling? And I can happily confirm that I'm very pleased with, with what I've determined 
Yeah. Uh, I'm actually none of those. But because I've dealt with so many of those and I've had to build a resilience and then fight fire with fire, it did make me think, fuck me, I'm quite good at doing that. Is that who I am? It's not, I was just defending myself and you put me in front of someone that's lovely and pleasant, vulnerable or not. I'm, I'm pure in my intentions. Mm. That's good. That makes sense. Of course. And uh, we all have psychopathic traits and narcissistic traits. So we're now getting to my kind of conversation now. <laughs> yeah. We, we, all, we all have them. Like even yeah. the nicest people in the world will sometimes... We're sitting here now with cameras on us. If yeah. that's not I narcissistic. Fucking, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Put more on. Let's get, let's get more cameras. Uh, but yeah, I'm a, oh, mate, I'm, I am like a narcissist. I do, you know, sometimes catch myself and think, you know, drop yourself down a notch, Lewis, or, you know, I do sometimes want all the limelight. I, I can be persuasive or whether that's manipulative or not, you know. I can catch myself thinking, shit, am I, you know, I can manipulate about even knowing I'm manipulating sometimes, you know. So it, I can't completely deny some of the accusations that have been thrown at me. Um Because yeah, obviously with success, people obviously want to now tear it down. So they're they're mm. they're looking for what still remains of this bad guy. And and there are things that are still there because like I said, it's not curable. You can only learn to have awareness around it and learn to to manage it. But luckily, I'm also on the like on the spectrum. So it's not on the autistic spectrum, but on the psychopathy spectrum. So I'm not a full blown one. So I do feel I can cry. I do care, you know. But it's just different, and it is just different to other people. And I have to, I have battled throughout the years of learning, of going, shall I accept this and take this and truly understand it and, and live with it? Or should I fight the battle and get them emotions out because they're in there? And I'm still on that, I still battle. But I'm, the, I'm, the more I battle, the more I think i got to live with it. Hmm. Because I've done a lot of work. You know, I've been in the jungle in Bali doing ceremonies and fucking breath work and tantra and water purification ceremonies and mushrooms and fucking, I've tried everything. And I can get a flicker, but a normal human range of emotion, uh, I hope it's not a limiting belief, and I'm, but I don't, I don't know if it's fully there. I can get a flicker. <laughs> I almost felt that. Yeah, that's the truth. No, it is that. It is that. I, someone can sit down. But it gives me abilities to be able to see things other people can't see. It gives me the ability to be uh, objective in scenarios. It gives me the ability to make decisions other people won't make. It gives me the ability to help people and push them in a decision where they would not let themselves go. For example, I could sit there and someone could reel off the worst trauma you could ever imagine. And they're crying their eyes out. And there'll be people that would not be able to handle that situation. But... I can intellectually understand it and have forms of empathy and understand, but don't feel wrecked and consumed to the point where I can't challenge that person to start seeing alternatives or shifting perspectives or breaking beliefs or moving forward from life. And I can really, you know, be there for people uh, in an objective way that others wouldn't be able to be there for people. Well, a true leader needs to keep themselves together when someone else is falling apart. Mm. Yeah, and, and, I, and I am a leader, you know, in the business that I do, community that I lead. I've been called a cult leader. Um, and it, and someone needs to make these decisions, you know. The fu society, you know, functions on the notion that decisions need to be make, made and swiftly uh, in order to be able to move forward. And if, you, if, if you're paralysed by you know, emotions, you stay stuck. And I see people day in, day out. So the number one reason why people don't succeed in life is their emotions. It's because they they fear so many things or or have some sort of imposter syndrome or it's not just it's not just the emotions, obviously the mindset as well, but it's some kind of limitation that they put on themselves. Do you ever feel any doubt of your ability? Not anymore, no. no. Now I'm like the opposite of what I used to think about myself to the point where it's gra it is like borderline grandiose. So it is, um, but not in a, I, I try not to be arrogant because I logically understand that's not a good trait and I don't want to come across that way. But my inner stimulus tells me that I am destined for great things and that um, I can do whatever I want.
Mm. So um, my goals are as high as you can imagine. And I truly believe that I can do it. I mean, if a personality disorder is a, uh, a disability, that's a hell of a disability to have. The power mm. of belief that you can do anything. Mm. And I've kind of always felt like that, but mm. I've just felt like I can do anything and fuck everyone else kind of thing rather than I can do anything so I can make a great life for myself and I can help other people. You know, it's kind of... But you, you now encourage other people to adopt that mindset, don't you? Of course. Uh, well, I, I don't teach necessarily my way of thinking, no, because I am different to most. But I have the ability to understand how people work uh, and I've created frameworks and models and techniques um, and I've experienced other people and heard them and and analysed them, essentially, and figured out lots of ways, plus the traditional ways that I know that I've learned as well. It's not just all unique, and I've picked up loads of tools, techniques, and things over the past that have been around. Um, but I train what would work for the everyday person. You know, I'm not necessarily having a niche for people with personality disorders um, because it wouldn't work as well for them, you know, because not, not many people have the same challenges or advantages that I do. For example, you know, most, most I could tell you all people's fears, fear, the fear of putting themselves out there and being vulnerable and being criticised, the fear of rejection, humiliation, embarrassment. Uh, these things absolutely cripple people. Do you feel any of those? No. Embarrassment, fear... I mean, I can't. I mean, I don't want to act like I've got nothing there. Mm. I mean, of course, if I was taking go out for a date and I fell on the floor and you know shit myself or something, maybe I might <laughs> be a little bit embarrassed. <laughs> and, and and if a fucking massive guy ever fucking put a gun to my head, I'm going to be scared. Yeah, like. Mm. But it's just not. It's not a normal range. Mm. It's just. Yeah, yeah. It's just. To, I'd say I'd, to give you an honest, honest answer in a percentage because that's the kind of way my brain works. I'd probably say my emotions are about 10% of what everyone else's are. It's great that you've got an understanding of it. You've, mm. Well, there's enough emotion in there yeah. for you to understand emotion. Yeah, and feel it as well. It's not abundantly there naturally, you know, so I've, so I've got to really harness it. But I can use my my, my brain to, to use that 10% better than people with 100% can without the, without the, the intellectual brain. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because, because I know logically how to help people what the right thing is to do what the bad thing is to do more so because i've done so much work on myself now i can really harness the emotion that i've got and channel it you know into the right areas to really make a difference whereas there are people who have lots of emotion but don't necessarily understand how to regulate it how to use it how to channel it into passion filled things or making a contribution to society or impact or have any desire to make any sorts of moves um, so it's arguable that my lower emotional capacity is still being used in a greater ability than others with a full range. And all your life experience and your the coaching that you was initially doing, your business now, so just remind me of your company name. The Coaching Masters. So the Coaching Masters, your founder, and you've got a business partner that, that you bought in uh, called Liam as well, you now teach other people to become life coaches themselves. Is that right? Yeah. So it's not MLM for everybody who fucking always says that. And it's not a scam either. <laughs> well, this, do you know what? So that you end it on a, on a high. Yeah. It's probably because, I mean, if it, if it wasn't on the documentary, I wouldn't have mentioned it. I just thought, well, we won't give it any oxygen. But the fact it's out there and, yeah. and Netflix put it right at the very end, that's going to be what, that will be like the, the, the last thought in someone's head. Yeah, yeah. When really it's a rags to riches story. Uh, so Louise Clark, mm. who's an ex customer, has gone on Netflix and said that you are creating a cult mm. and you're unreasonable. Like, who is she? And why was she, and how did she get her spot on Netflix? Yeah, well, I, I allowed, you know, I had influence, and I, I, I allowed whatever needed to be in there to be in there, and uh, I wanted it to be a fair um, judgment of me. And producers put out a call for anyone that wanted to say something bad about me to give a different perspective of, of me, so it's not just you know me saying everything that's amazing about me. And uh, she stepped forward, and I knew it was going to be her anyway, uh, because you know, without going into too much details, I don't want to 
really give her any any sort of airtime really. She was a happy member of the, the community. Um, we just launched a new course. Technical problem happened where we hadn't upgraded our Zoom account to over 100 people on the uh, on the live that we were doing. And uh, she wrote in the group like, what's going on? Where's the Zoom link? This is really unprofessional. Exclamation mark, like 30 exclamation marks, right? And I just commented on there and I said, and then and a few other people said, yeah, me too. I'm not happy. She created a bit of a bit of negativity. And that is a no-no in, in our community. It's one of the rules. And that's why it's seen as a bit of a cult because it has rules. Because um, it's a culture, you know, and one drop of poison spoils a broth. I don't want negative people like that in there because the whole point of it is supposed to be motivational community to motivate sport and inspire each other to go out there, change your life, change other people's lives, live a great life. Negative people shouldn't be life coaches. Anyway, I wrote in the comments, guys, calm down. We're all supposed to be life coaches. And she fucking went, she saw it as a big dig, big embarrassment in front of the community and uh, create a big mutiny with some other people and stuff. And, and it was, it got ugly. They, they created like a Facebook group and tried to add in all our members in there and kept doing a Facebook live and uh, saying all, all these things about us. She said that I had books, I had a bookshelf with, full of dark psychology on it. It's like complete lies. She said our business was dissolved uh, just because we, uh, we, re we restructured the company during a uh, funding round. Um, and she just she and she got kicked out of the community and she was just resentful about it. And I was I was going to say she uh, yeah she failed in in her mission because then there was also an ex police officer police woman yeah on the Netflix documentary who literally couldn't sing your praises enough mm. uh, to the tune of you have changed her life and you've shown her the light and this is she now knows what her purpose in life is and she's never been so happy yeah I mean, she was crying with happy mm. tears yeah, yeah it was beautiful yeah. See, that makes me feel a bit happy. So, See? Oh, yeah. I'm not Sitting a psycho. Oh, my God. Happy oh, now. There's a, the, the happy psycho. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I just want to reiterate, look, I'm not a cold, a cold, brutal, mean guy. I'm a little boy who's fucking been traumatised, who maybe has a disorder, maybe doesn't, who never really either learned or wasn't able to fully get that range of emotion and went down the completely wrong path to the point where I made decisions that most people wouldn't usually make. It still is there. I am harnessing it to to help others. But I do feel and I do care and I am a good person at heart. Although some of the things I say sound very sinister and if they're chopped up into little bits and they only get a little bit of the conversation without context, it doesn't make sense. But I just hope that people will appreciate my authenticity and my vulnerability to be so honest in the hope that it it can help other people that may be in, a same, in the same situation, have felt the same about themselves, don't understand themselves, maybe have a partner or children that are the same. Um, and also obviously inspire people to, to know that no matter how fucking bad you think you are, that's just that's not who you are you can still change everything about, you know, the things that you do and the person that you are, even if you've got mental health conditions. Because, yeah, I didn't even mention that I also got diagnosed with bipolar at one point. I was given antipsychotics. I was also, also, uh, was also diagnosed with an emotionally unstable personality disorder. Who fucking knows what I've got, who but I am. You're not on any meds now? No meds now. Well, I am for epilepsy, long story. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, let's talk about the business and the good things. I built the coaching business and I had other coaches saying, Lewis, how the fuck are you doing this? Like, I've been doing this for 30 years and you are, you know, absolutely crushing it. Can you teach me? And I said, well, you only just do this, this, this and this. And it was fucking simple stuff. Like, it was like, post your face on social media, you know, help people, even if you don't think you're necessarily going to get a sale straight away. Uh, have a package to offer, um, get people on calls, you know, and sell your fucking coaching program. <laughs> like it was so simple, but it was just in an era where you didn't do that. You know, uh, it was either they were scared of it 
or it just wasn't the done thing. So it was a combination of kind of we hadn't quite evolved as a species to be that sort of technologically savvy, but also the fear of doing those things because they were so unknown were just stopping people from taking the obvious steps that you know that you would take to get clients, you know. So it's very obvious, but you need both the strategy, uh, the awareness, we need the strategy, the awareness, and also the support of the mindset to overcome those hurdles of actually putting yourself out there and creating an offer that you can actually have confidence in yourself to deliver and, you know, booking those calls, even though you're scared if you're going to get a rejection of that sale. So it needed business and mindset support. So I ended up transitioning into this person that trains and helps coaches, which there are fucking loads of now, but back then there weren't. And it was never my intention. It's just who came to me. And then they started saying, well, how are you getting such good results for your clients? I said, well, I've also got quite a lot of different things I do there as well. And that's when I met Liam and we created uh, our first coaching program. And it was a 12-week live course on Zoom. And we got to the end and we just couldn't believe the results they had. It like completely changed their lives. It wasn't even supposed to be a life transformational program. It was supposed to be how to teach other people. It was supposed to be to teach them to coach others. But their life was changed <laughs> because you can't help but, you know, learn it yourself in mm. order to be able to help someone else with it. So... We were just, we was like, oh my God, we got something different here. And we delivered it in a very different way. We were swearing in it. We were, you know, getting, like my business partner cried in it. We were sharing our traumas in there. It wasn't this purest, clean coaching where we're saying, hello, today we're going to be teaching you about the grow model. It was just gritty. This is the challenges that you're going to have. These are the techniques you can use for them. And here's some of our stories about how it helped us. And it was so organic and raw and real. And we never even expected it to be a course. It was just something we was going to try out. But it came out flawlessly perfect. And we've never changed it since. It's made millions and millions of dollars every year. And it's the same Zoom recording from 2019. <laughs> that's awesome. And that's how good it was because it came, I guess, from the heart. And that's difficult for a psychopath to say, but <laughs> came from the heart and, and the brain. <laughs> it came from a little heart. I'm like the Grinch. Mm. <laughs> it came from a little heart and a lot of brain. You come from Liam's heart, your brain. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people people have referred to me and him as the hug and the slap. Mm. He's the hug and I'm the slap. You need both. Um, but then we also created other courses. Uh, we we uh, Luckily, I had this ability. Um, I, I just, I'm a, there's, no way, there's no easy way of saying this without sounding arrogant. I'm just a good businessman. Um, knew the things that had to be done. They all worked, <laughs> took some big risks, they all worked. And then, yeah, made millions of dollars and then we started hiring more team members. Then we invested into virtual reality and we created new courses and membership sites and have ads run in and um, yeah, all, all different types of coaching from holistic modalities to neuro-linguistic programming to, yeah. And now we're actually in the process of becoming like an accredited college um, and, and, and br branching out into sort of mainstream uh, education and trying to disrupt education that's actually my net new goal and where can people find your business the coachingmasters.com we we do we offer a free training it's like a webinar 20 minutes it will teach you about what life coaching is and if it could be for you a lot of people watching this will be thinking yeah but i can't be a life coach i haven't got my own shit together the beauty of life coaching training is it's personal development as well you know i always say become your first client mm. and you also so happen to get a very valuable skill set at the end that you can make money from so worst case scenario you're going to be in a better place from doing it you know best case scenario is you find your purpose in life and you also have a very good you know income stream because coaching is a great business because all you need to do is have a laptop and you can coach people and it's and it feels rewarding and fulfilling and you know when you've got something truly valuable to offer it's it's easy to make money from it because it's a very good exchange so anyway, you can come and watch a 20-minute training. If you like it, there's a membership for $9.99 a month. That's all it actually is, £8 a month to, to learn hundreds of hours of training. And if it's not for you at that point, you could jump out. And if, if it is, then you can go on to our live and accredited courses that are those a mixture of those recordings with live workshop facilitations and our coaching trainers that will you know do classes once a week and really go through that process and uh, help you out for months and months on end until become very successful and confident coaches so yeah and also i'm assuming the business is on is on instagram as well yep yeah. i mean that's a lot of people's go-to minute now for, yeah for and companies. also i am as well i mean you know i'm the kind of 
linked to everything we do. I've also got, we've got a co-working space out in Bali, which is really cool, called Cafe Coach. So if you're out in Bali, everyone, you can go and, you know, we do workshops up there and there's, there's coaching questions on every table. So you can sit there and eat and like ask each other deep questions. Is that quite a cool concept? We'll, um, we'll put your we'll put your links in the bio. But so what's your, so your Instagram tag is Lewis Raymond Taylor. Luckily, I'm the only Lewis Raymond Taylor in the world. We didn't get around to that one, did we? Why well, I changed it to that? It's my dad's name, Raymond, mm. and I added that in to change. Well, no, my name is Lewis Raymond Taylor, but it's my middle name. But I, ch- I changed it to be Double Barrel because I wanted to change the way that I saw myself, and it felt very different to have a different name. And it just happened to be my dad's name, which is a fucking weird kind of complex thing, I think. that, that Maybe that was, I don't know, a driver or not. Do you love your dad? My gut is telling me yes. My brain is telling me no. So I think that's a yes. That's one where there's there's trauma there rather than the psychopathy. You know, that's, mm. you know, or the antisocial personality disorder, sorry. Um, that would, that's a hard one to, I guess, admit. I still um, love mine. Yeah. For all the fucking terrible things yeah. he's done. And I can't believe how I even do. I even said it in court. Yeah. When I'm being cross examined and I told the judge and the jury, I still love him. I yeah. can't help but love him. I still get butterflies when I hear his voice. I don't want to love him, but mm. I do. But it doesn't change what he's done. And he needs to be punished for yeah. that. So, yeah, for whatever abuse your dad put you through, I totally understand yeah. why you would still love him. Yeah, well, you know, that's helped me out. You know, I, I, I say well then. <laughs> it's, if, it's difficult to say um, for a number of reasons because you know it's like admitting to a girl you like them when you know they don't like you or they don't know you don't know if they like you. So you don't know if you want to admit that kind of thing, you know. So I've never been able to resolve these things with my dad because he died, uh, you know, thirteen years ago before he hasn't seen anything, he doesn't know who I am. He just still remembers. He still would have known me as this fucked up kid, you know. So. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one um, but yeah it's a good thing to admit that I love my dad I do but it's hard to say I think that is a good thing to admit because by rights you shouldn't but that 10% human side sort of is a nice thing to have yeah. in you isn't it yeah Definitely. and I love my mum yeah, and it sort of sets you free as well. It's like I've said it; it's out. Yeah. Whew. I mean, I, I feel tingly even think, even thinking about it. Really? See, I don't, yeah. don't I don't get that. You know, like I said, I battled with can I nurture these emotions and can I get that ten percent up to a twenty or a thirty? And I and I am on a lifelong quest to do that. I'd love, you know, I would love that. <laughs> you married, aren't you? Yeah. Do you love your wife? Yes. Um, You'd be in serious shit if you didn't. Exactly. Tell <laughs> um, but I've been, you know, very transparent. My love is different. I don't. I, I don't have the, the, I don't I don't even know how to explain it because I don't know what you feel. But that's the truth. It's like trying to it's like having a blind person and trying to describe them yellow. They can kind of go, yeah, I think I can kind of get what you're saying. So something like bright, yeah, um, but they don't know what yellow is. So, I think I know what love is. Does Does the thought of your wife leaving your life hurt you? Or do you, do you just think, oh, she's gone, she's gone, next? Is there fear of loss? Much less, much less than you think. That's the truth. Mm. Yeah, most, mu- much less than bef- than the most people. And that might be because of the, the loss that I had with the, with the other girlfriend. So that could, again, be another trauma response, I don't know. I would put, I can put either a barrier or it's not there, but... Like there's five love, love languages, acts of service, which is doing things for people, um, physical touch, which is kissing, fucking, you know, things like that, even cuddling. Um, there's words of affirmation, telling people. There's quality time and gifts, giving people things. So I understand them intellectually, so I'm able to give love mm. fully in a way that someone w- would expect to experience it. But I'm intellectually processing processing it and I don't really feel it other than like lust and probably the immediate uh, initial spark. But, you know, that tethering that I think people get, must get, you know, mm-hmm. for me, I don't have that. Have, have you had this discussion with your wife? Yeah, she knows. So, I, so, to, it, she, so if she, she, sometimes I don't feel loved by her at all. Uh, but because I'm saying 
you're not like this. And it sounds really chauvinistic, but it's not. But it's like, unless you do these things and I see them, I won't be able to know that you love me. Like you can radiate love all day long. Mm. Yeah, but I don't feel it. Mm. And she's like, I'm giving up, showing you love. I love you. And I'm like, how do I know? Because most other people must be able to feel that. Um, I, me personally, I need the words of affirmation. So someone needs to tell me and they need to really mean it as well. Like mm. I, one of the first things I said to my wife is I said, when I met her, if you actually like me, I need you to really show me others. I will not believe you and I will not feel it. I said that like a couple of days in and she ended up having a panic attack because she wanted to tell me she loved me. And mm. that was the thing that I went, I believe you because you wouldn't be having this panic attack if you didn't love me. Um, I, 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 I like things like dinners, like this is not in a chauvinistic way. I don't expect it, but if a woman will make me a dinner, um, I feel loved. I'm like, you're doing that for me. You know, I appreciate you for doing that for me. You must do that because you love me, you know? So it's mainly a logical understanding of love and what, what love must mean. Um, and also care for that person but i think most people is this unconditional default of warmth love tethering and attachment with these other superficial things that kind of fall underneath for me it's kind of the other way around i get that as well totally well, it's a it's a action speak louder than words type yeah. thing in it in regards to the future i was going to say what does the future hold for you yeah. but i think i've got an idea because i saw on your instagram yeah and might I add a very, very convincing clip of you in a scene acting out a scenario. So I'm assuming you're going, you're going to shoot for the stars and aim for Hollywood. Yeah, the plan is to do another documentary. Um, but also, yeah, I want to get, I don't, know, don't want to get into acting. I've got into acting, so I've got an agent now and I'm being put forward to, for roles. Um, there is a TV show um, coming up that I haven't announced yet. That you're starring in. Yeah, I'm actually the lead baddie. Also, but I'm still 100% focused on the coaching masters. You know, that's um, I'm just a, I'm just have this capacity to be able to ju juggle many things now because mm. I've grown and stretched in my um, ability to be able to manage more things. So I'm not pivoting. I'm adding on. So yeah, I'm I, I'm I want to revisit those. Because what I'm doing is I'm revisiting my childhood dreams. You know, I was sexually, you know, sexually abused and derailed that dream. And I tell people to go after their dreams, and I've got an amazing life, and I love what I do. But it's not my dream. My dream is to be an actor, and it's to be famous. Like I don't mind saying it. Like I want to be famous. Oh, and, own it. Yeah, I want to be famous, and I want to. I want to be known. I want to feel significant. And at the moment, you know, that's the closest thing I truly get to feeling that love. I've been able to travel the world. I've been able to marry my wife. I've been able to have a newborn son. Um, I've been able to help uh, 8,000 people become coaches. Those coaches have clients who are better in a better position, but then those people are then in a better place to be able to be around their children and their family. So the ripple effect that I've been able to have is genuinely millions, millions of people I've been able to help. And that's the biggest accomplishment and pride. I, I'd be lying if I said that it doesn't give me a bit of significance as well. Because I've mm. always wanted it, I've wanted it, and I've always craved it, I've always created values. I've always wanted significance, and I've found it through helping people and from being a good person. And as a result of that, it's given me success. You know, I've you know, had you know, all the sorts of, you know, I've got a book deal and featured in Forbes and, you know, get to be the CEO of a company. And to think that I was in prison eight years ago, I left the Mount, HMP the Mount, eight years ago. And I just recently went back into HMP The Mount to deliver a talk to the prisoners. And now they want me to come in and, be, and, and train their facilitators um, to, be able to, to be able to support the prisoners better. So if, in terms of a full circle moment, I know it sounds a bit like bragging, but obviously it needs to be shared in, in order for this story to be inspirational. Fuck me, what is that limitless potential that we all have? Because I would have never ever, ever, ever believed that I could do anything like what I've done. 10%, I would have said, fuck off, you are crazy. You know, I, I didn't even think I would be able to live 
You know, I was I was convinced I was going to die at some point. Uh, and if I was fucking lucky, I might grow up a little bit and mature and stop being such such an, a fuck up and maybe live a normal job uh, life and get a job. Never did I think I was going to be someone that could help people and make the world a better place. And I'm still going. I still want to make that change bigger. And I'm very confident I will because got hopefully got you know God willing, I've got a journey ahead of me still. You know, I'm still eight years, only eight years in. So I'm a young, young boy, if you think about it, in terms of my emotional development. You know, mm. St- only started eight years ago. So I'm eight years old. <laughs> if you think about it like that, in my new life, I'm eight years old. So I, I'm not going to sit here and say, like, I, oh, oh, I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy and fulfilled and every void has been f- filled with uh, abundance and joy. I've got a lot of work to do yet. But at this moment in time, I still want the fame, still want the, uh, still want, give me the followers, follow me, please. <laughs> 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 and but also I'm very much focused on the business I am so passionate and so obsessed actually with the business the coaching masters uh, we are creating a, a new brand a new platform like I mentioned that will be for uh, education outside of the coaching space so it's going to be personal development business psychology and it's even going to be stuff for kids because I think that there's no point teaching a child something if it's not being enforced at home and there's no point teaching an adult something if they can't communicate it effectively to their children. So we're creating this co-learning platform where children and their families can learn together in different areas and different subjects, but all tracked and monitored with gamification and things like this. Um, you can set points and scores and you can put incentives that are custom to each family. So, for example, you know, you, you might go in there and if you're a low income family, you might say at the end of the month, if you know, if we get, you know, 100 points between us, we'll go out for a Nando's. If you're a high income family, you might say, well, we're going to go to Barbados or whatever it is, but you get to control that, but you get to learn together and grow. And it's going to be alternative learning the platforms actually called Altern Learn. bit of a reveal there, alternative learning for families to thrive in the modern world, because it's putting, putting the education in that the government has purposely left out. Mm. You know, nobody fucking teaches us who we are, what we want to do with our life, what makes us happy, how to deal with fucking life. Uh, instead, they t- teach us photosynthesis and algebra and fucking put, you know, and then just stick us in the middle of this world and, you know, hope that we uh, adopt the, the jobs that feed their workforce and, you know, uh, feed into the system. So uh, Churn out employees, don't they? That's all they do, yeah. They, they've got a set curriculum that hasn't changed since the Industrial Revolution and it's literally outdated, irrelevant, does not help people and just gives them very, very average lives at best. But where's the personal development? Where's the emotional intelligence? <clears throat> it's It's not there at all. So it's not just the wrong information, it's missing information. It's completely archaic, redundant and irrelevant. And I can't believe it's still happening. So I will tr- create a new one. I promise you that. Well, I wouldn't bet against you in <laughs> any any realm. Your business speaks for itself. It's hugely successful. You've smashed that. I'm delighted for you. I don't doubt for one second that you will reach dizzy, dizzy heights with your acting career from what I've seen, very convincing. Thanks, and, and I've seen it, you know, everyone wants to be an actor and I've seen a lot of people act and I've seen a lot of people put their heart and soul into it. But if you're not convincing, you're not convincing. You were you were convincing. And I, and I look forward to watching that journey and thank you for coming on today. And I've loved and admired just how honest you are. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Cheers, mate.